Okay, everybody, let's call the meeting to order. And we are live on Zoom. So um, I'd like to welcome everyone to Lander. Good to see all these nice friends here and folks in the audience, uh, welcome. And, and there's actually people that get to live here in the audience too. So welcome, we got commissioners, clerks. and So thank you very much. Glad to see everybody. Um, let's start with the roll call. Senator Barlow? Present. Senator Boner? Present. Senator Landon? Excused. Senator Scott? Present. Representative Chadwick? Present. Representative Harrelson? Here. Representative Harshman? Excused. <laughs> yeah, you got it. Representative Knapp? Here. Representative Newsom? Here. Representative Ottman? Here. Chairman Chase. Present. Chairman Chairman. Thank you very much. And what I'd like to do before we actually get started is just have everybody reintroduce themselves and say where you're from. Let's just start down there with Senator Barlow and um, we've got an online audience too. So please and use your microphone. Morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee and the public. My name is Eric Barlow. I'm the freshman senator from Senate District 23, which is Campbell County. And a former Speaker of the House of Representatives. Hi, I'm, I'm Sandy Newsom, and I represent District 24, which is Cody and Yellowstone Park. Thank you, Representative. <clears throat> My name is Cody Wiley. I'm a representative representative of House District 39, Sweetwater County, Rock Springs, a little bit of greener. Representative Pepper Ottman, House District 34, uh, which includes uh, a lot of Fremont County. Thank you, Representative. Good morning, Representative Chris Knapp, District 53 from Campbell County. Representative Jared Olson from District 11, downtown Cheyenne. And Representative uh, Olson is the House Chairman. Um, Senator Boner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Brian Boner, District 2. <clears throat> That's uh, Converse and Eastern New Toronto County. Boris Chadwick, Representative from House District 62, one of the two new ones. Includes the eastern, basically, third of New Toronto County and the western third of Converse County. Mike Yen from House District 16, covered the town of Jim. Charles Scott, Senate District 30 in Nakona County. I represent the uh, western and northern parts of Nakona County, majority of the constituents in the Casper area. Representative Haraldson. Thank you very much, Chairman. So, Jeremy Haraldson, House District number four. I represent all of Platte County and the northern part of Laramie County. And thank you for allowing me to vo uh, join you guys virtually. We are doing a VBS at our church in the evening. And so I am gonna be a Roman soldier at night and a legislator by day. Is there a lot of difference? It all depends on the day. My name's Kale Case and <laughs> yeah. Um, welcome to my district. I live in Lander and I'm very glad to be here. Can we go through the staff? I, I, can we start with you, Katie? You guys have microphones? Yeah, Lou Plum. Josh Anderson from LSO. Kelly Lower, LSO. Emily Wongan, LSO. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming. And um, Katie Talbot, I, I should mention, is does double duty. And during the session, she's actually the House Chief Clerk. And then so, you know, and I don't ever recall that happening before. So that uh, maybe it has, but anyway, welcome. Well, everybody, welcome. The first item of, of a business for us is to adopt rules for the operation of the committee. Uh, Mr. Anderson submitted a proposed set of rules that are uh, the standard rules for committees that allow for co-chairman uh, uh, 
uh, instead of uh, uh, chairman and vice chairman. He, uh, they're the rules that were adopted by the Revenue Committee. So um, entertain motions on the rules. So moved. Got a motion by Chadwick and a second by Ottman. Any discussion? All those in favor of adopting these as our rules for this interim, uh, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Got an opposition by Harrelson. Um, all right, the next item of business is uh, the Elections 101 presentation from our county clerks. And Mr. Irwin, maybe you'd want to introduce all the, at some point you're going to introduce all the clerks, right? And your, your council and everything. So I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to share my screen really quick so that you can see the presentation. We'll walk you through it. Uh, my name is Malcolm Irvin. I'm the Platte County Clerk, and I also have the privilege of serving as the president of the County Clerks Association of Wyoming. Joining me today, and when I introduce them, if they would just stand up, um, Julie Fries from Fremont County. Maureen Murphy. We never followed directions in high school. Yeah. Maureen Murphy, we call her Mo. She represents Teton County. Gwen Bartlett, Carbon County Clerk. Carrie Long, Sublet County Clerk. Deborah Lee, Laramie County Clerk. Colleen Renner, Park County Clerk. Becky Kirsten, Hot Springs County Clerk. Also with us today are uh, deputies from our offices, Hans Odie and uh, Katie Johnson from Park County. Dale Davis from the Laramie County Clerk's Office. Margie Irvine, Sarah McWain, and Brianna Duenas from the Fremont County Clerk's Office and Lisa Smith of the Carbon County Clerk's Office. And of course, joining us today is Mary Lankford. She serves as our boots on the ground during the session at the Capitol. We always encourage legislators to reach out to their county clerk, but in the hustle and bustle of a session, we understand sometimes that doesn't work. So Mary's our on-site representative uh, to field any questions you may have during the session. Mr. Chairman. Let me just say welcome to all of you. It's very, very nice to have you and see you again. We appreciate what you do. Back to you, Mr. Irwin. Mr. Chairman, in the wake of Memorial Day, I would be remiss if I did not pay my respects to those who gave their lives in defense of this great nation. Their sacrifices ensure that we are able to remain the bastion of freedom, and the Clerks Association is grateful to those who gave their lives in order us, for us to remain a republic of, by, and for the people. As county clerks, we have a small role in ensuring that this republic remains one of, by, and for the people. As election administrators, we take the charge very seriously that each vote cast by qualified electors is done in a secure and accurate manner. We appreciate the opportunity to present a high level overview of election administration in Wyoming, which we hope shows our dedication to protecting the hollowed right to cast a vote and have it counted accurately and securely. We have done our best to synthesize this presentation to one hour, but just for reference, our judge trainings, they range anywhere from two to four hours. There's a lot of information in election administration, so we've done our best we anticipate this will be question driven. And Mr. Chairman, the way we developed this uh, PowerPoint was so that questions could be fielded on the subject, but at the chairman's discretion, we could wait until the very end and field all questions, which would be the preference. Um, looking at everybody, but I, I think if we could have questions as we go along would work out better. Okay. That's all right. So appreciate that. You're good. So Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, let us begin by covering very quickly the role of the county clerk. Um, although the clerk has many other duties prescribed by law, here's a list of the election duties squarely in the county clerk's purview. As you will see, there are a number of other elections that take place throughout the state besides the primary and general elections, which get a majority of people's attention. I think it's important to note that there are odd year elections. We've had some March special district elections, May municipal elections. We will have some special elections this November. So Mr. Chairman, we just wanna make that clear. There are elections in both even and odd years. Also on this next slide is just a, a list of special districts that are subject to the election code. As you can see, there are a few options that Wyoming citizens have um, for special districts. For the timeline, I'm not going to um, bore you to sleep on this section and go through every date. But really, we wanted you to have this, um, this presentation going forward so that 
when you see an, an election related bill that impacts the timeline, just understanding that this timeline is compressed. There's a lot of moving pieces to it. And so when we reach out, it's not to try to put a monkey wrench in the idea. It's just to make sure the timeline doesn't get uh, messed up. For instance, on slide number nine, in um, June and July of 2024, you'll see there's only 23 days between candidate certifications and the day or the day ballots must be in our possession. In that time frame, we're in ensuring that each race uh, to be voted on by a specific precinct split is on that ballot. We ensure that everyone is on the ballot who should be. Proof for errors, we have those ballots printed and in our possession. For Platte County, we have our ballots printed at, um, in Casper, and so that also has to include shipping time. So, Mr. Chairman, that 23 days is very tight, but it gets even worse um, when you are talking the period of time between the primary and general election, only 15 days between the day that candidates are certified to our offices and the day ballots must be in our possession. So, Mr. Chairman, that's the, the timeline at a high overview. Unless there's any questions about that, we'll move on to voter registration. And again, Mr. Chairman. Finish your thought. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. All I was going to say is we really just want this to be a this PowerPoint so that you can go forward and see these dates and see what we're looking at. So you've got an idea of the timeline we're working with. Thank you very much, Senator Scott. Mr. Irwin. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I don't believe that it's a, a new addition. Uh, I couldn't tell you the year, unfortunately, that um, they became part of at Chapter 29. Mr. Chairman, Scott? because we had a water and sewer district that was not doing it that way, and it was causing trouble. Mm. Uh, Mr. Kocho. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, what is the what is the purpose, I guess, behind some special districts being on this list and others not? Is that just a product of the legislative process and it just so happens to be that at time these were brought? Or do you have some background information as to why these specifically fall under the election code? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I can't specifically say why those are part of the or subject to the election code. All I can tell you, I took that directly from Chapter 29 where um, it says these are the districts subject to. I'm, I'm just gonna speculate a little bit. Um, special districts are kind of a, a broad range of different things and they, they collect their money in different ways. And so some of the elections may be from uh, taxpayer situations or things like that. But I, I knew that if I talked long enough, Julie Fries would correct me. So this is all part of the plan. Mr. Chairman, Julie Freese, Fremont County Clerk, and as you recall, I served on the task force for special districts with the good chairman here um, and several other people, um, and I've said this a lot of times, we worked really hard to get everything under Chapter 29 for the special districts so we'd all follow the same rules, but periodically legislators will put in a special district that does not follow the election code, and I speak about that a lot because We've had mis we have we had a mistake here recently in Fremont County where because I'm used to a certain way of it going, um, and it didn't go that way, I wasn't following the principal act as closely as I should have been. So it it's really helpful to those of us who are putting on those elections to make sure that those are all grouped in Title 29. So I think that's why some of those aren't in there is that left them out of the process. There you have you have some different election thoughts on them. So all I was going to say. And before you run away, um, I don't know how many special districts there are outstanding, but is there a, is there a good reason to leave <clears throat> certain special districts off of the list of, of that, that fall under the election code or should, I mean, it just seems like in my mind, maybe my mind is a little more black and white, but it seems like all special districts should be subject to the election code or none should be. It just seems strange to me that, that we would leave some out. Um. I think it depends, Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Olson or Co-Chairman Olson, Co-Chair Olson, sorry. Um, 
I think it depends on how they want the voting to go. Um, I know in the I know the senior citizens district is listed on there, but they have their primary election to form the district in the primary, and then the general they vote on the board. That isn't always the way that that um, works out is that primary general thing. Um, so it depends, I think, on how you want that special district to be run as to whether or not it fits into the to the voting process that you have in 29, which is pretty regimented. So maybe there's some reason in there you didn't want it to follow that. Also, the, the size of the district makes a big difference. Uh, the water and sewer district we had trouble with started fairly small, informal, and it was the sort of thing where you go twist arms to get, get a board. Uh, and then it got to be big business uh, and really as large as, as some of our smaller counties. And at that point, you need to have the kind of formal election the election code uh, provides. And maybe what you need is a trigger in those laws it gets over a certain size, it goes to the election code. Because there, there are a lot of very small districts and those are, you really don't need the formalities in the election. You need to get some volunteers. Uh, but a, a big one, uh, we found they were using very informal methods and they were not responding to their constituency and were fighting with the municipalities because of it. And they needed the formality of the big election, formal election. Thank you, Senator Scott. Back to you guys. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Talk about voter registration. It'd be Hans Odie and Katie Johnson of the Park County Clerk's Office. Welcome, Mr. Odie. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as Malcolm said, I'm Hans Odie. I'm the uh, first deputy Park County Clerk. And this is Katie Johnson. She's our elections deputy. And she's in her third cycle of, uh, of elections with us. So she's got some pretty good experience and master's in, in uh, political science from the University of Wyoming, wow. go Pokes. And I personally have uh, 20 years in now. So I was- And you formerly were the, uh, the clerk for Hot Springs County. That is correct, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Yep, I was a three-term county clerk in Hot Springs County. And now I, we're entering our third term with, uh, with our clerk, uh, Colleen Renner. So we're, I've got a little bit of experience here. So, <laughs> but, but Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. We'd like to talk to you a little bit about voter registration. Um, so voter registration is permitted any time of the year, except for 14 days prior to the election. Um, why is there a 14 day cutoff? That's for the uh, clerks to prepare their poll books, especially in the larger counties where they have <laughs> tens of thousands of pages to run off, especially like in Miami County and Natrona County. In Park County, we are able to do our, our poll books the day before, but we still have to abide by that 14 day cutoff. So anyone registering uh, new registrants that are coming to register with us in that 14 day period, as long as they're new, they must vote on that same day because Wyoming is a same day elections or a same day registration state. So um, when are our uh, changes allowed? Name changes and address changes can occur anytime. Party affiliation changes, if they're a new registrant, they can affiliate at any time as well. If they are a current registrant and uh, have, have already registered with us, but uh, they may not affiliate, as you folks know, uh, any time after the first day of candidate filing for the primary election. And then uh, we don't allow uh, registration changes after election day for a period of time. This allows for better post-election uh, uh, reporting on our end. What are the qualifications to register? You must be a citizen of the United States, 18 years of age, a bona fide resident of the state of Wyoming, not a you're not currently adjudicated mentally incompetent. Remember that only a court of law may uh, adjudicate a person court, uh, mentally incompetent. Um, and if they're a felon, they had their 
uh, rights restored by by the DCI and DOA or DOC. Residency requirements, uh, as defined, is the place of a current cur person's current actual habitation and to which whenever they're absent has the intent of returning. Remember that for down the road here. Um, notice that there's no durational residency requirements. The Constitution says that there shall be a one-year residency requirement in the state and in the county. However, in 1972, that durational residency requirement was overturned by the state Supreme Court. So um, that's important to know about residency requirements. Um, the intent of returning, uh, as I was just talking about, is purposely vague. And that is uh, to cover our military personnel who have residency in Wyoming, our missionaries who have residency in their hometown, our college students who still have residency in their hometown, persons who are temporarily working out overseas, um, out of state, oil field workers, uh, and such. Uh, merchant Marines, we have several merchant Marines in Park County, if you can imagine that. They fly out to LA and get on a ship and, and take off, so. Um, election judges, can challenge residency, um, or excuse me, the, the reasons for election judges to challenge a voter at the polling place or even in our offices is uh, they're not a qualified elector, um, not entitled to vote in that precinct, uh, their name doesn't appear on our poll list, not the person they represent themselves to be, they, maybe they've already voted, and does not have acceptable identification. Now, going back up to that, um, the parts where they might not be in the right precinct or a, a, yeah, not entitled to vote in this precinct. We have people all the time in Park County that show up in Powell when they need to be in Garland or in Cody when they need to be out at Wapiti and places like that. We're gonna just redirect those folks. They're not entitled to vote in that precinct in Cody, but we're gonna redirect them and get them out to their correct precinct. So, um, a judge, if they challenge a, a person, what documents can they uh, use to to prove prove up? Um, those documents are provided by rules, Chapter Two, and they would be things such as the utility bill, a bank statement, government check, pay advice, paycheck, um, mortgage statements, housing verification from one of our colleges, um, or a government document showing their name and address. Um, the inability to provide or pr prove residency allows prospective voters to obtain a provisional ballot, which we will talk about later in more detail. So when we're challenging citizenship, these are, these are also provided in rules and what documents we can request. Uh, uh, again, it's a passport, U.S. citizenship, a certificate of U.S. citizenship, naturalization, a draft record, a selective service registration acknowledgement card. Mr. Chairman. No problem, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Sorry, I was slow to the slow to the gun there. But I want to back up to when there's a challenge, there's a list of things from the Secretary of State's rules that can be required to prove up residency. I'm curious what other states do when um, establishing residency, not not challenging residency, but establishing residency. It, in Wyoming, you just you just produce an ID, um, and then you I assume you sign an affidavit, if say or you basically are saying I swear that I live here when you register to vote. But are there some states, for example, that require you when you register to vote to provide like a utility bill to prove up residency, Mr. Chairman? Mr. Co-Chairman, thank you for the, the question. Um, as far as what other states do regarding residency and registration, I apologize, but I'm unaware of what other states do. We kind of have our own rats to chase here. Um, however, on our registration application, there is an oath on the registration application that we're going to go over here in just a little bit. And that oath does, they are, the, the voter, or the uh, registrant is, um, making the application, they are swearing that they are a citizen of the United States. They're swearing that they're a bona fide resident of Wyoming and of this county. 
um, that they're 18, that they're not adjudicated mentally incompetent, um, and that they've had their civil rights restored if they've been a, a felon in the past. But I, uh, I sounds like Malcolm may have some some further information, if I may, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Olson, the question about other states, we've actually just started this conversation with the Secretary of State's office. And um, just last night, actually, we obtained some information. We will follow back up with you. We don't have it prepared for today, but we will get it to you. Chairman, on the uh, list of documents on approving residency, uh, a lot of those seem to involve mailing addresses. Does that cause trouble? There were some communities, and I expect still are, where everybody's got a post office box number and it's not the physical address, and the physical address becomes important. How, does this list cause trouble with those communities? I'm sorry. I was just pointing out that uh, uh, some of these lists would have a physical address on them, but I'm yielding to the clerks to answer the question. Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. Senator Scott, thank you for the question. Yes, uh, Teton County, for example, is all PO boxes. Um, they they do not have PO or they do not have uh, uh, residential delivery. Um, but I would. I would uh, agree with Senator Case in that your utility bill from the, say the town of Jackson uh, would definitely have a physical address on that because that's where they're serving, right? They're, they're servicing a residence and that residence would be then on that utility bill, but the utility bill would be mailed to a PO box. Or REA or has so I'm I'm wondering are your people experiencing any problems with this list? We need to think about broadening. So, I mean, Senator Scott, I'm just kind of looking at the practicalness of this. If 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 what they provide doesn't establish the residence, they've got to provide something else. Is the way I imagine it works. And I do understand your situation with a lot of different meters on your ranch property and things like that. But I think for most people, they have a single electric bill pretty clear that uh, the residence is identified. Mr. Chairman. Back to you, Senator Scott. If we only had one thing, it still doesn't. You have to know their the mm -hmm. power companies or the REA system to know where that meter is. It very it's well not, could be in the rural areas. I, I grant you that. You know, Bates Creek has always been a mystery to me in all these years we've served yeah. together. But <laughs> in cities and towns, I think they do tend to have your residence on it. So let's go back to the clerks, bring us home. Oh, I'm sorry, I represent Ms. I have a question on the driver's license. Does that have to be a state of Wyoming driver's license or can that be a driver's license from another state? Mr. Chairman, Representative Newsom, thank you. Uh, we'll get into that here in just a bit, but no, they can, they can utilize a Wyoming driver's license. That's our A number one. We love Wyoming driver's license. It fits in with what we do here in Wyoming, obviously, but it can be a an out-of-state driver's license. If they have an out-of-state driver's license, they have to provide the last four of their social security number for, to us as well. Can I interrupt everything? I'd like to make an introduction if we could. I, the, the Senate president has joined us and he's in the very back of the room. And uh, uh, President Driscoll, would, would you mind standing? And uh, very good to see you. Thank you. What, what did I do wrong? <laughs> You're not here to talk about my chairmanship, are you? Uh, <laughs> just check it on you. Welcome, sir. <laughs> Very good to have you. Who is who is uh, who is back? Uh, Senator Scott. 
the appropriate time to ask questions about the residency requirements. Let's, let's ask our presenters. So, Mr. Chairman, if we could just hold for just a little bit, we may cover some of what your question is Hang about on. here uh, in, in a couple of future slides. Back to the clerks then. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So we'll move on to challenging citizens. Oh, wait a minute. We, we're challenging residencies? Where are we at? Oh, we're on the registration. My apologies, Mr. Chairman. So in front of you, you should have a registration form. This is the uniform registration form that we use across the state. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to roll through this like I would with a, uh, if you were standing in front of me in my office and registering to vote. So we would, we turn this around to them and we start with box number one and we ask them to fill in the re their eligibility, which asks about their citizenship, what, uh, whether they're over 18 and what their fel felony status is. Name is obvious. In the identification box there in number three, we got the date of birth. And then the three check marks on the right-hand side of that are driver's license. Do you have a Wyoming driver's license? If so, what is your number? If you do not have a Wyoming driver's license, uh, we have them provide the last four of their social security number. Um, and then box three there is they do not have a Wyoming driver's license or a social security number. So then we'll, we'll tackle that here in the future slide as well. Um, I will say that that uh, third box in my 20 years of doing this, I'll bet I haven't had more than a handful of people that have had to go on and get some other form of, of identification for registration. Um, most everybody has a driver's license from another state and their social security number or a Wyoming driver's license. I mean, it is very rare that we're in that third box. Additional information there, your email address, phone number is uh, optional for voters to fill out. Um, the one box there is, uh, I would like to be an election judge. We use that in our office. We, we look for that. And in our voter registration system, there's a checkbox we can mark on that. And then that pops up a list of folks that want to be election judges. And then we contact them and say, were you serious? <laughs> because we'll take you. <laughs> so... Um, and then in, uh, in number five there, the residence address, that's where they abode, where, where their current habitation is, what we were just talking about. Their address, where they receive their mail. It's important to us if they do not get their mail at their residence address, because in off years, we may have correspondence for them. There may be precinct changes, there may be district boundary line changes, things like that, that has put them in somewhere else, and we need to send them a notification on that. Party affiliation, as you're aware, we're a closed primary state. However you affiliate, that's what ballot you're going to get in the primary, Republican, Republican, Democrat, Democrat. If you're libertarian, constitution, or unaffiliated, you would get in the primary election an unaffiliated ballot if one were available in your area. Remember, unaffiliated races in the primary are generally only your city councils, okay? Uh, or if there was a taxing question that was on your primary ballot, that would go on an unaffiliated ballot in the rural areas, okay? So if they're updating a current Wyoming registration, we want to know where they're coming from so that we can pull their information from that current Wyoming jurisdiction over to Park County or whatever county they're moving to. If they're coming to us from another state, we want to know where they resided in that other state because uh, we provide that information to the Secretary of State of Wyoming, and then the Secretary of State of Wyoming then notifies South Dakota or California or wherever they're coming from, hey, John Smith has moved from your jurisdiction to our jurisdiction. You need to uh, remove them from your roles. In number 10 there, that's the, the oath that we were talking about a little bit ago. Um, they are swearing an oath that says, I am who I am, that I'm 18, that I'm not currently adjudicated mentally incompetent, and that I am a, a citizen of the U.S. and the state of Wyoming and the county of Park, and that I've had my civil rights restored if I was a felon, and I can prove that. Then they sign that, signing their oath, and then uh, below, we're verifying their identification that they provided to us in, in number 12, and then in number 13, Essentially, we're notarizing their signature and them uh, swearing to that. On the back side of this registration, this is uh, on the Secretary of State's website, and I assume it's on all of our local county websites as well. Uh, is the uh, 
or instructions if a person were to be uh, uh, registering by mail and what documents they needed to provide to register by mail with us. That happens in Park County once in a while with the folks in Yellowstone because um, it's not always, uh, the road's not always open coming to Cody from Mammoth and you know, to get there, they'd have to go through Livingston, Montana, and back, back to Cody. So um, there is registration process by mail. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ode, um, I have a question on the front page. I haven't filled out a registration application in many years, so I don't know if this is new or um, just point of clarification. Under number five, where it says I have no fixed residence. This is a location I regularly return to. I have also provided a mailing address in section six if I have one. Um, it seems a little vague. Sure, Mr. Rody. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Senator, or excuse me, Representative Altman, I tried to promote you. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's not a promotion. <laughs> Depends. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I always hear about upper and lower houses. <laughs> Go ahead, Mr. Representative Olson. Oh, oh, pardon me. Gosh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. So uh, that is that is there intentionally for our snowbirds. Um, you, we have plenty of people in the state of Wyoming who uh, who lived here all their lives, and all of a sudden they find themselves retired. They sell their property, they buy a $200,000 motor home and they go on the road, um, but they can still claim that Park County is their residence address. And that's, that's what that is for. Go ahead. Is, um, we have situations where people kind of stay places and to uh, verify that, but also is there um, a requirement like, well, you need to be here six months, you need to be here or in that county three months. Is that somewhere in statute or is, is that important? Do we need to look at that? Mr. Rody, Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Ottman, uh, remember we were just talking about durational residency a little bit ago, and that actually there is no durational residency requirement in Wyoming at this time. If you want a fishing license, by golly, you better be here six months. <laughs> <laughs> but I think we're going to discuss that further, I'm sure. Keep going. Mr. Chairman, I, um, one of the handouts we provided too is just a flow chart of the uh, registration requirements and process. If you're interested, have a look at that on down the line there too. Um, just a little bit of further information for you. Uh, Senator Landon has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just, just real quickly, I'm sitting here going through this form, I just thought to myself, I wonder in your experience if anyone has ever misrepresented themselves on this form. And if so, mm -hmm. what are the ramifications of that? Do we ever catch anybody? I, you just never read about that. You never, I'm just curious. Mr. Trump, do you ever catch anybody misrepresenting themselves? Well, I know that uh, Clerk Freese has got people. But Mr. Odie. Mr. Chairman, Senator Landon, thank you for that question. It's a very good one. Um, yes, we do catch them. And yes, there are people who are nefarious and misrepresent themselves. Um, and it's not frequent. Uh, however, I would say that it happens several times uh, during each election cycle where, uh, because we are a same day registration state and we have uh, registration at the polling locations. So you as a new resident or even a longtime resident that has been dropped from the rolls you can come in and register on election day at your polling location. And we do not have, uh, in our county, we do not have the means uh, to input that registration at the polling location and check their status. Because we'll talk about that here in just a little bit too, about our voter registration system goes out and it checks the status of their felony convictions in Wyoming, things of that nature. Um, so when we bring these registrations back to our, our offices and we get them uh, input into our systems in the next several weeks over or after the, the primary and general election, that's when we catch them. And, and again, it's one or two maybe of an election cycle. 
in our county. Um, I don't, we had one this year, I believe. Yeah, I think we had one out of, I don't know, we probably did oh, two, 3,000 uh, uh, same day election registrations. And we had one, I believe. And, and so at that point, what we do is we, uh, we call the sheriff's office. The sheriff's office comes in and, and opens an investigation into that uh, registration in that person. And, uh, and then we turn it over to them and they investigate it. And then they turn it over to the county attorney's office for prosecution. And I, and I might add that this committee and the legislature um, kind of changed the level of penalties on uh, for, for um, voter fraud, basically. We, we have two levels, and I think Senator Scott helped me with this, but we have a misdemeanor level, which is where it might be really inadvertent. Um, and and uh, you're not intentionally trying to deceive and things like that. And then we have a more serious uh, uh, level. And the reason that was done is because we were finding that prosecutors were not inclined to pursue some of these cases sometimes. But Senator Scott, back to you. Cameron. A couple of uh, things. We did have a, an election a number of years ago in Oklahoma County. The, uh, 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 Keith Goodenough and Mary McGuire. And it was discovered that a number of people <clears throat> registered same day and gave their address had a place proved to be either a vacant lot or a parking lot. And that probably was a fraudulent registration. They were helping out one of their friends. And of course you can't prove which friend they were helping out. Uh, but nothing was done about that one. Uh, losing candidate didn't choose to make a big issue out of it. Uh, though it was a very close election. The other problem, practical problem you get into is where somebody has uh, residences. Uh, it is, I think, as I understand the law, it's it's very much a matter of their state of mind as to which one is their primary one, and it's awful hard to prove that they were they were out trying to defraud things. So uh, that makes it that makes it considerably more difficult. So the committee's kind of taken over here, but you go ahead, finish your thoughts, Senator Scott, please. And Mr. Chairman, is this the appropriate time? I, I, a question on the Supreme Court decision. Um, perhaps, um, let's hear it. But Senator yeah. Landon has a follow-up uh, for his original, and then we got Senator Bonham too. Okay. My question is on the one that overruled the duration of residency. Did the Wyoming Supreme Court just to pay, declare a piece of the Wyoming Constitution, unconstitutional? Or is there a bunch of federal precedent elsewhere that the federal government doesn't allow it? What, what happened? We did ask the Yellow Soda prepare a memo on that that was distributed. You wouldn't have a hard copy of that memo for Senator Scott. We did kind of anticipate that, Senator Scott. So mm -hmm. might take a look at that. Are you good, Senator Lannon? Go back to you. Well, just the, the quick follow-up, and you touched on it. Appreciate, uh, you know, the curiosity that I've been asked. Do our laws have enough teeth? In other words, if, if someone fraudulently fills out one of these forms and you send it to the sheriff, in your experience, do we go ahead, are charges filed, and, and have, we, have we seen some prosecutions? I'm looking at other clerks. Uh, I'm seeing... Knows, not not many, a yes. couple, one or two. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you, Senator Landon. Um, we have prosecuted in in Park County and won. Uh, it's been in the past. Um, I I think I, I don't want to throw other counties under the bus or other county um, attorneys under the bus, um, but there. Are, there seems to be uh, a propensity to not uh, be as serious on these on these crimes as they are uh, extraordinarily busy with um, with serious crime. Uh, and when I talk about serious crime in Park County, it's murder. 
it's uh, it's assaults. It's it's you know we're getting to be a big county and we've got a lot going on in our county attorney's office, or we're or we're suing over cell phone towers. So, so thank you. So, Mr. Chairman, okay. <laughs> the reason I asked that question is we've heard so much over the last three or four years, all the fraud, all of the you know elections were based on this fraud, and so. I think it's important for us to know whether or not the laws we have in place are being abided by and and prosecuted there and all of that. So thank you for the answer. Appreciate it. And then Senator Landon, just to, you might point out as well, there is very few of these cases, even the ones that are declined to prosecute. If you, just very few. But Senator Boner, you have a question. Mr. Chairman, so uh, maybe you'll get to this a little bit in a couple slides. It looks like maybe slide 26, but you went over the process you have within your county. I'm wondering how you work with other counties or at the state level to verify the same thing. Say, for example, you do have a, a college student that is registered in their hometown, and maybe they're in Laramie. Uh, how do you, you know, verify that they aren't voting twice? Uh, and like I said, so you can answer that now. It looks like you might get to it in a little bit, uh, whatever, you, whatever they like. Yes. Great question. Thank you, Senator Boner. Back to you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Brody. Thank you, Senator Boner. Uh, that is a great question, and and what is really great, and this is I can follow up, kind of with uh, Senator Landon at the same time. Our voter registration system is very robust. Um, no, it knows if uh, Malcolm is registered in Platte County and he goes off to college in at the University of Wyoming and he walks in to the office down there and registers. They know immediately when they put in his driver's license number or his social security number um, that he that he's registered in Platte County right now. It comes up and it matches and says, "Hey, do you want to pull your pull this person's registration from Platte County to Albany County? Yes or no?" And you, you, at that time, we question them and say, "Hey, you were registered in in Platte County at this time?" And they're like, "Oh yeah, yeah, I forgot to tell you on." on uh, box eight that we're we're moving here from Platte County. But our system, again, is very robust and checks that out. And um, unfortunately, we can't check out state registrations, um, but in state, um, we know if they've been registered and we know if they've been registered in the past and were dropped off the rolls. So uh, they, there's an inactive record um, in the history. Mr. Irwin, and then we have more questions on this side. Mr. Chairman, Senator Boner, the actual act of voting after the election, and we will get to this just in a little bit, um, through the poll book process, we assign through Wild Reg voters credit. So we essentially give them credit for voting. That way, Wild Reg says Malcolm voted. And that way, and then we run a uh, um, multiple vote report, and it's Wild Reg is detecting whether that same individual voted in a different county. I know that in a previous session, you talked a lot about the unique identifying number that Wild Reg generates, your voter ID number. That's how it tracks that uh, Senator Boner voted in Converse County. And then uh, if he tries to go to Natrona County, that's how it knows you voted in both. How many, time, how many times has that happened? Does anybody even have a case? Interesting. Uh, Representative Mann. Thank you. I, I was just curious on. Item four, um, the I need assistance to vote checkbox. Is there a follow-up with the clerk's office when that's checked for this to see what assistance is needed? I know in Campbell County, we have um, very long lines and sometimes people that can't walk, they can pull up and, and an election clerk will come out for them to vote. What type of instances is that and do the clerks follow up? Who would like to take that? Mr. Mr. Odie. Yeah, Mr. Chairman. Um, that that box seems to be ignored quite frequently and and is not often used. Um, generally, a person that does need assistance, uh, not only will they check that, but they'll vocalize that to us as well. Um, and um, Clerk Freeze will get into the express vote here in a little while. Um, that is an ADA accessible machine that is um, that. Folks with uh, sight impairment, um, maybe they don't read well, uh, maybe they have macular degeneration, things like that, um, they can use that. Uh, we can also make uh, a number of other accommodations as well. So um, 
voters are allowed by statute to have a person um, help them with their ballot. So um, if if I couldn't see and I didn't want to use that, Katie could help me come and and fill out my ballot. So thank you for the question, Mr. Would, it, would it be fair to say that a lot of people that require extra assistance, they don't go to the polling place, but they choose to vote absentee? I mean, that seems to what would happen. Mr. Chairman, that's probably the most uh, the most uh, used uh, item is is uh, absentee, yeah, where they can vote at home with the assistance of their spouse, their caregiver, or whoever. And then, are we still tracking Senator Scott's earlier question? We're going to get to that at the right time. The, not saying we jump to it now, but yeah, I think we're coming to that. Okay, keep not, going. We can come back to that. Keep going. He, he would need to reiterate. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Now we'll go on to ID to register and what options there are uh, for a person to register. Um, the three options are the driver, Wyman driver's license. Again, this is our most preferred um, uh, way of, of identifying a person. Um, if the Wyman driver's license is not in there or is in possession, uh, the judge would verify the identity and nothing further is required. Um, and then if they're not in possession of their Wyoming driver's license, they must produce the driver's license number. Maybe they remember their number. They have it memorized. Um, and then they would confirm the identity using an additional identification, uh, such as a passport or something of that nature. Um, the tribal ID must be issued by Eastern Shoshone or Northern Arapaho tribes or another federally recognized tribe. One thing to note on that is that the uh, identification must include their Wyoming driver's license number or the last four of their social security number, but we cannot take it at that point. It would not be a valid uh, ID for us to take. It did not have one of those two items on it. Um, and then additional ID, uh, if the applicant doesn't have one of the two items listed above, then they come up with their most, most generally, they come up with their uh, state ID from another state, their state issued driver's license or ID card from another state, uh, and then provide us with the last four of their social security number. So an additional ID is provided by uh, rules in chapter two. And again, those are uh, uh, ID to, to register, tribal ID card, a U.S. passport, uh, an ID issued from another state, um, federal, state, or local or government issued ID, uh, photo ID issued by one of our colleges in the state, or a public school in the state of Wyoming. ID that, uh, an ID card um, that is issued by a state or uh, U.S. Armed for Forces to a dependent member. Um, those are also acceptable. Or two of the following items, uh, U.S. citizenship, um, a certificate of naturalization, a military draft record, uh, voter registration card from another county or state, uh, U.S. Uh, Social Security card, birth certificate, or any other form of ID issued by the state. And Another benefit of using a Wyoming driver's license is not only that we get to trust the ins institutions already within the state, but a Wyoming driver's license is real ID compliant. So we know there's that extra stringent um, requirement there. And would and, you mind saying your name again? Yes, I'm, I'm Katie Johnson. I'm the elections deputy for Clark Thank County. you, Ms. Johnson. Thank you. Keep going. Um, <laughs> and the overwhelming majority of those who register to vote do so using a Wyoming driver's license, a tribal ID, or an out-of-state driver's license. So while it is rare that we get down to that point where we use those two um, other options for ID, it doesn't happen very frequently, but it is a crucial process to have that in order for the people who need to use it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Now we're gonna talk about uh, ID to register versus ID to vote. Remember several uh, sessions ago, the legislature passed ID to vote. So uh, requires persons who are uh, coming to our polling locations, who are voting in person uh, to present an identification to the poll judge or to our office if they're voting early. 
Um, the ID to register is intentionally more restrictive. Um, that's where we are vetting who they are, who they're saying they are purporting themselves to be right there in front of us, right? Um, and the uh, and that registration or that ID is even uh, uh, required on election day when they're if they're registering to vote at the polling location. Same process as what we do in our office. Um, and then the ID to register in is, play, is in place to confirm that identity. Are you who in, who you are in fact, Mr. Co-Chairman? Thank you, <clears throat> Mr. Co-Chairman. On the ID to vote in the last election, were there any instances that surfaced where somebody was presenting themselves as somebody who they weren't? Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, Sen or Representative Olson, uh, we did not have that case in Park County, and I, I can't speak for any other counties at this time. This is all pretty fascinating, actually. We've had a lot of discussion about showing an ID at the, at the polls, but the true workhorse ID is, at the re is the registration ID. I mean, that's the one that's thoroughly vetted. So that when you get to the polls, it's a matter of just verifying that you're the person on the list. But, and so a lot was made about showing an ID at the polls, but, but even before we began to show IDs at the poll, we didn't have any instances where voters would go to the polls and allege that they were someone else. So that later on in the day, someone comes in and they try to vote and some, the poll watcher says, uh, or the poll uh, election judge says, well, you voted this morning. And they go, that never, ever happened. And then now, I mean, we would expect it to even be less likely to happen, but, but uh, it's like cutting zero in half, actually. So we, we just don't have this problem. I mean, and people miss this all the time. They seem to think that we have rampant people voting for someone else. It just doesn't happen. Have I characterized that correctly? Mr. Chairman, you were absolutely spot on. Represent yet. Chairman, thank you. I, I know in Teton County, we did a lot of press, which is great uh, coming from the clerk's office to remind people that this is going to be the election where they have to bring ID to vote. W were there folks in your counties where people were turned away because they didn't know that they had to have ID? Mr. Rose? Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Yen, um, I would imagine that there were several cases of that. Um, I, I don't recall of any in Park County. However, we don't get full reports from our election judges. You know, they don't they don't keep track of that. You know, as a tally, of, you know, how many they turned away because they didn't have an ID. But I would I would assume that that some people did forget. And and if they if they live, uh, you know, in a remote location and they trekked all the way to town to vote, um, and at that point. You know, if they didn't have their ID, um, they could vote a provisional ballot and then prove up the next day. Um, we again, we'll talk more in depth about provisional ballots uh, later in the presentation. But uh, I, I don't believe that it's a a, a wide uh, problem, widespread problem. I really don't. Anybody else? Back to the clerks. Mr. Chairman, we kind of now covered ID to vote, <laughs> so I won't I won't belabor that point. ID to vote is is if they're you know they're coming in they they present their ID. I'm my name is Hans Odie. Here's my identification. I live at three three two four Appalachian Avenue, and and they check me off, send me to the ballot table, and I grab my ballot and go vote. Okay, so. Uh, a person who is newly registering on election day will present their ID during registration, and then they will again present it at the poll table, at the ballot table, or at the uh, poll poll list table, um, where where they will be again vetted uh, as to who they are and who they're purporting themselves to be. Senator Scott, we got a microphone there. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, in the precinct where I vote. The poll workers know virtually all the uh, voters. Uh, are they justified in saying, okay, we know this person, we don't need further ID, or they still nope. have? <laughs> Mr. Chairman, Senator Scott, we would fire them for that. 
literally we would we would take them out of the polling place for that. If we found if we found out and we investigated it and and they were doing that, we would we would take them off of off their duties. That's we take our job very seriously. <laughs> and and the only path through that, Senator Scott, is if you don't have an ID is to cast a provisional ballot right. and then show an ID later. The next, the so day. so is. this is something, a law that we passed that they take very seriously, of course, that is a bit disruptive in some instances. So I, uh, <clears throat> and I see people that are my neighbors when they ask me for my ID and they, they know who I am, and but that's the world we're in now. <laughs> they don't care about that. <laughs> Mr. Odie. Mr. Chairman, one of our seasonal workers ID'd his own mother um, uh, when she came in to vote early in our office, gotcha. and and appropriately so. That's that's what we do. So keep going, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. So we're on to Wild Reg. Um, I've talked a little bit about Wild Reg already. That's our statewide voter registration system. Again, it is statewide. It's uh, required by by the Help America Vote Act of 2002. Um, and you'll remember back to what happened in 2000, and that's how we got the Help America Vote Act in 2002. Um, and that's where Wyoming uh, was able to utilize the monies that came down from the feds to create WyoReg. Again, it's a very robust system. It's statewide, it's real time, and it links all of us together. And it's, it's wonderful in that respect. And not only is it a voter registration system, but it's an election management system as well. We we manage our election from from registration through absentees to candidate filings with this system. It's it's pretty it's a pretty sweet system. Let's say that. Um, WyoReg assists us in verifying voter for qualifications that are required by statute uh, by going to it, it reaches out, reaches out and touches YDOT to share information on driver's license. So when we put in a driver's license number, it knows that, Hey, you just put in Hans Odie's, uh, driver's license number. Um, it goes out and checks, uh, felony convictions through the department of corrections. It checks, uh, deceased individuals through vital records. And then, uh, for voting re for voters with, felonies who've had their uh, rights restored. Uh, the Board of P Parole through the Department of Corrections uh, provides us, provides WireEdge with that information. Um, and then the SOS shares information with the uh, Supreme Court to generate jury lists as well. Uh, in 2022, WireEdge electronic poll books were utilized by three pilot counties, which allowed them to have real-time information on voter status and qualifications right at their polls. So when I tell you that in Park County, we register people on paper, and then we bring those, those registrations back to our offices, and a week later, we're inputting those registrations, and that's when we catch our felons. These three pilot counties that were using WireEdge Reg e-poll books at their polling locations, they were able to catch those people on site. It's fantastic. We could tell, they could tell, those, those three counties could tell immediately what, uh, what their status was. Are they a felon? Are they deceased? Are they 18? Are they, a, you know, all these, all these agencies that they go out and check against, they're doing that, that check real time at their polling locations. So that's just a, something that we're, uh, that we're working on as an association. Uh, Senator Landon. Question, where do we stand on the new computer system? Are we up and running um, through the Department of Transportation? Oh, um, you know, uh, we've spent the last two or three years trying to get that up to speed. And I'm just wondering, are we, are we online now throughout the election system? So, <clears throat> Senator, or Mr. Chairman, my apologies. Senator Landon, uh, so the Revenue Information System, also known as RIS, um, I was actually on a committee to uh, to go through and and review the um, the vendors for that system when we were uh, getting ready to to do the system. 
So they've hired a vendor um, and they are working on they're working on the transportation side first, um, but eventually they will get over to these other agencies that are uh, that we are 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 in connection with. So transportation side, um, you know, we would be connecting with the new system through driver's license sooner than the other agencies at this time. But that that's a huge, huge project and one that we're uh, glad that uh, the legislature funded for sure. Mr. Chairman, I go ahead. The concern is, you know, hopefully we can get that up to speed this year, uh, right away before we get into another election cycle. So I was curious. Thank you. Hopefully that transportation committee is going to do some good work in that. Senator Scott. What's your policy with the electronic poll books? If there's a, a power outage uh, during the during the day and the electronics are down, uh, how, did, how are we going to handle that? I know, Mr. Chairman, in the rural areas where we don't have the redundancy that you do have in town, particularly in thunderstorm season, we do have power outages of frequency that's enough that sooner or later it's going to happen on election day. Mr. Chair, that Bates, Bates coal is just a very dangerous place. <laughs> so all this stuff happens. Mr. Odie. Mr. Chairman, hopefully the dam doesn't break above him. Right? Uh, <laughs> and the Buffalo stampede right there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, turn that question over to uh, Clerk Freeze, who was one of the pilot counties. If you don't, she mind. left. <laughs> she she saw it coming. Oh, okay. Actually, uh, Clerk Murphy from Teton County also utilized that same system. So, uh, Clerk we'll... Murphy, welcome. Yeah. You have that microphone and help yeah. us out. Maureen Murphy, Teton County Clerk, and I do believe um, Dale Davis is going to be going over all the e poll books next. But we have a whole folder for emergency power outages where we do have our poll book printed out and we can register and get them through that way. Um, hopefully the power does not go out because in most of my polling places, there are not a lot of windows, but um, <laughs> yeah, so there is a backup system to that. Also, if the connection goes out, there is a way to be offline in those modes as well. And just a side note, we did have four potential felons that we did um, find in the process of our e-poll books this year. And our Teton County attorney did, did prosecute the ones from 2020 that did vote. And four out of how many voters? Just a question. 10,250, I think, something around there. Great, great catch. Can I ask you a little bit more about the power outage contingencies? So uh, if you have voters in line and they, uh, the, you just save the paper ballots and then run them through again, or how, how do you do that? Because one one assurance part is where a person can actually put their paper ballot through the reader, but Correct. if the reader's down for electricity purposes, uh, I believe, how, how does that work? I believe that in the equipment, election equipment, they'll That's, show you all of that. There is an emergency bin in this that you can put your ballot in. Okay. And there is a backup battery. In okay. all of our machines as well. So if, but if something happens where they can't run it through the machine with the backup battery, there is the emergency slot. It's like a drop slot. Wow. It's pretty cool. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Who's next? Back to Mr. Irwin. Mr. Good Chair job, you guys. Good job. Mr. Chairman, I do, I would like to circle back with your permission and answer a little bit more of Senator Scott's question about PO boxes. Please do. Senator Scott, your question about PO boxes, um, really the place that we see the issue is not necessarily the documentation um, trying to prove that residents once that potential voters challenged. Where we find the issue is in many jurisdictions, that's what's listed on the driver's license. Um, and so that's where we face more concern is that the driver's license has the mailing address as opposed to the physical address. And so I just wanted to circle back and and say, Mr. Chairman, that's really where we see the art, the issue more. Anybody else? Okay. Do you talk about poll books? Deputy Laramie County Clerk, Dale Davis. Great. Welcome, Mr. Davis. I've seen a lot of you lately. Grab that microphone. 
Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Dale Davis. I'm the Chief Deputy for the Laramie County Clerk. Um, my topic is... Um, you might pull that mic a little bit closer. My topic is uh, poll books. I did hand out a handout to everyone, which uh, says paper poll book. And also it does have um, the screenshots of our e-poll books also. The one that Laramie County uses is uh, Vote Safe, and the other pilot counties, they use the Wild Reg. Okay. Poll books are uh, printed not earlier than 14 days before the election. The 14 day period is the voter registration cutoff. The poll books information is extracted from Wild Reg, the centralized database for the state and counties. After 5 p.m. the day before election, supplementals to the poll books are created to capture any changes since the poll book was created. Then those supplementals are delivered to the uh, precincts or also are communicated to the polling locations. Uh, the poll books has all the information for election judge to know who's registered vote, such as name, residential address, residential address, mailing address, party, and ballot style. When the voter approaches the election judge, the election judge will ask the voter their name and their residential address. Um, and the voter will provide an acceptable voting uh, ID for uh, voting purposes. The poll books notifies election judges if the voter has voted uh, by or request an absentee ballot. If the status indicates the absentee ballot has been received, the election judge will explain to the voter that they have already voted. If the voter does disagree, then vo the voter will be offered a provisional ballot. Suppose the poll book information indicates that the voter will send an absentee ballot. Then what the judge does is call the county clerk's office, ask the county clerk, have you received the ballot? If the county clerk says, uh, no, we have not received the ballot, then the county clerk will cancel the voter registration, or not the voter registration, but the absentee ballot. And then the um, a voter is able to vote at the polls. Uh, the meaning of the status is sent. The county clerk has sent the absentee ballot to the voter. Um, the, uh, received, the county clerk has received the absentee ballot from the voter. The election judge will write in the poll book a sequential number showing that the voter has voted. Depending on the county process at the um, poll book station, the voter might receive the ballot or they might have to go to another table, the ballot issuer. If a voter is not registered to vote or needs to change the information, um, the voter will need to fill out a new voter registration card and then the uh, election judge will write that information in the poll book or the voter's name in the, vote, the poll book. After election day, the county clerk will use the voter registration forms to update the um, Wild Reg or the um, poll book after that to um, assign credit that the voter has voted. E poll books. E poll books. Um, Laramie County was the first county to pilot them in 2015 with a special city election. Working similarly to paper poll books, except when um, more information might be um, available, such as birth or the date of birth or the age. This is useful because the Parents or children living at the same residential address may have the same but slightly different name. Uh, the information will be extracted from Wayo Reg the night before the election and sent to the e-poll books. The data would, be, would include any vote, new voter who voted by absentee and any absentee votes received by the county clerk. On election day, the county clerk will update the e-poll books of any absentee ballots received, e-poll books, are connected to each other real time to help counties using vote centers to ensure that the voter has only voted once in that county. Laramie County election judges use an ID scanner to pull, the, uh, pull up the voter. Wyoming driver's licenses and ID cards have a bar, usable barcode on the back. Our judges love this and it helps ensure that the correct voter is marked as voted. The ID scanner was first piloted on a limited basis in Laramie County in 2021 special purpose tax election. Once uh, one, one of the first elections to use acceptable IDs for voting purposes. E-poll books help to give more information such as 
the time, date, and location the voter voted on election day. Depot books help to ensure the accuracy of data. Any changes, new voters and voting history are updated to WireRidge Reg and reviewed by election staff. During 2022, Fremont, Natrona, and Teton counties pilot the Wild Ridge e poll book. Paper and e poll books are reconciled against the ballots cast or a reason for the difference are noted by the election judges. And thank you. I'm here to answer any questions. Okay. Questions for uh, Deputy Clerk Davis. Any questions? Any questions about e poll book? What, um, this may be a question for another for later, but I'm not sure. There was a new story up this morning about a system called ERIC. It is a national system. I don't quite understand if that is a national sharing of information among the states, sort of like our registration system is among our counties, sort of. You could look at it that way. Um, and the, the new story this morning was that eight states, uh, largely red states, were choosing to not participate in ERIC. And it sounded like um, and I don't know what Eric stands for. I'm sorry, I, I read it, but that that would prohibit checking registration in different states at the same time, much like we can check with the e-poll books, whether you voted in a particular county or where you registered in, in a county. And I don't know, Mr. Davis, I might be putting you on the spot totally out of the field, but maybe somebody could address the parallels or not, and maybe I'm all wet on that. That's okay to say, too. Okay. Um, Mr. Chairman, I would like to defer that to SOS. Okay, we'll do that. Uh, Representative Ottman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just have a, a question on the e-poll books. If, if there are voter centers and the e-poll books are set up, what if one of the centers um, goes down? How, how does that work with the books? Mr. Go ahead, Mr. Davis. Represent Ottoman. Um, what happens is if if the connection is broke, uh, then what would happen is as soon as it gets online, all the poll books would up, be updated again. But people still can check in and um, register. But once that um, connection is broke, but then it would, after some time, um, update all the other computer systems within the um, county. Follow up, please. So if voters leave that poll center and go to other centers um, to vote, what, um, how does it all get all caught up, I guess, is what, is what I'm wondering. Um, go ahead, Mr. Davis. It's connected, um, Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Alderman, it's connected to the county central place and then, um, I have not seen where it's gone offline in Laramie County. I'm not sure about other counties, but but eventually it gets caught up. It just, um, all the com computers are connected once it gets online and then uh, transmits the information to all the different uh, vote centers. So would it be fair to say following up on a question that, say there is a problem with connectivity on the e-poll book and Remember, everybody, this connection for e poll book purposes is a different than for voting purposes. They're two different things the voting machines and all that, not connected to the internet, nothing to do with the internet. The e poll book, though, is an online system that checks to make sure that you're not voting in different places, that it's up to date, and so and so just registered here, so they can't be voting over here. But they're two different systems. The e poll book is kind of like the outside door. That lets you into the system, but then you have to go into the next system that's not connected to the internet to actually vote. So this gets confused all the time. So when Wyoming and most, as far as I know, everywhere, the machines, the voting process, not connect to the internet. And the fact that we talk about e-poll books with the communication, it's not the same thing. And But anyway, uh, if conceivably the the, the e-poll book system were down on an online basis. You still have what was there at the last time it was updated, and you continue to operate the vote center normally. You wouldn't you wouldn't send people to another center. They they, and then after the the problem is restored, there would be a double check to see that the e-poll book would be updated all all around. Do I have that right? 
Um, Mr. Chairman, that is correct. And also we do use a VPN connection, which is a secure connection. A secure connection. So that's yeah. the safeguard there. And so to think of like a targeted attack on voting where someone were to somehow simultaneously take out the e-poll book system around the state and then scatter and simultaneously vote in different vote centers. Uh, you know, that's just such a crazy far-fetched idea. And I can't think of a way that they could pull that off. And uh, we really have a good system, but back to you, Representative Ottman. Just for a comment, um, and in no way was this to uh, question the integrity of our system, but just to say that was an experience that we had here. And I did go because massive amounts of people were leaving the poll center and I asked what was going on and they said, it's down. So I went um, about 10 miles away to another system where we could vote there. So that's why I'm asking about uh, how it works and if that, if there was backups, if that was just, and I haven't had a chance to speak with my clerk. So um, that's why I was asking. Yes, thank, thank you. you. So I th it might be a good idea if we did speak with our clerk about the problems with implementing that first time on that system um, and re what really happened there. And I will give you that chance. And maybe if this is a good point for that, but I don't know. Mr. Mr. Rowan. Mr. Chairman, Representative Ottman, um, there were those issues, those three pilot counties using the Wild Reggie poll book in the 2022 primary. Um, and I won't go really into the specifics, but you are right. The system experienced um, a couple of issues, some hiccups, but those were rectified for the general election. Um, and the good of that situation is it really forces you to work on your contingency plan. When the connect connection between the e-poll books fails, they essentially operate like a paper poll book. You know, only four counties in 2022 used e-poll books. That means 19 used the traditional paper poll book polling location. And those aren't connected, obviously. So if they came to a, a polling location in Wheatland and then tried to go to Glendo, you wouldn't know until after election day with the paper poll book. With the e-poll book, you know real time, but if that connection is severed to um, Chairman Case's point, it just operates on a local database that this was the information I had at the time of that connection failure. And once that connection is reestablished, then they can communicate and update. Here's the voters we had while we were offline. And so if, I hope that answers the question, Representative. Look, Fries, uh, did you want to let, if you wouldn't mind coming forward, just because it raises questions in people's eyes, but Congratulations to you for being one of the pioneers on this system, for sure. And I know it was kind of a little bit hiccup, hic, hiccup y but um, I think we got through it well. So to you. <clears throat> Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Julie Fries, Fremont County Clerk. And of course, if you don't make mistakes, you're not learning, right? Right. So uh, in all three counties, we did experience a, a slowdown of the system. We had our judges calling saying, this is going slower and slower. And I was calling immediately to the Secretary of State's office explaining that we were having this problem. And so um, eventually it kind of ground to a halt and we had IT at all of our locations. And so I was asking, I have done everything they've asked us to do, go off, go on, you know, and all that stuff. And finally I said, pull the plug. We're gonna go like paper because that was our backup plan. And so uh, fast forward to why that all happened is um, they didn't realize how much, I mean, how many people were going to vote, even in these three counties. And that information going into a pipe this big, and they had this much stuff trying to go into it from all of our counties uh, was too much for that. And so actually by me going off, the other two counties, they jumped right back on and they were going. Um, my judges felt very uncomfortable in some locations, and so we left them offline. And exactly what happened was, is when we came back online, you continue going. So for a little while, yes, we got some lines going on and we had our judges going up and down the lines explaining we have a problem with the system. We stay in line, everybody at seven o'clock can vote. So those who left, I feel bad for that. Um, but we did have five vote centers across the county. Some of them did choose to go to other 
um, locations and vote. Some chose not to vote. And again, I, and this is like at four o'clock in the afternoon. So the message was continual. If you stay in line or if you're in line at seven, you will be able to vote. Um, by the end of the evening, I don't think we were over except maybe in one precinct in the, you know, the time frame of, of voting. But um, so I, the people who left, um, like I said, I can't, can't control that. And I feel really bad about that. Um, but everything that we did after that to balance and make sure, so we had miraculously no felons, no deceased during that time. If they had voted in several precincts, you guys in Fremont County know this, I will make sure that they go to the um, investigation process and go through prosecution. Um, so in the general election, that went very well. We have balanced in both in both locations, and I felt good about that because that's what's important is how many people voted, how many ballots went through the machine, and they all matched. All of our paper ballots, Margie spent hours, I can't tell you how many hours the staff and, and her did on making sure that they all balanced for what paperwork we had, matched the people, <clears throat> excuse me, that ended up on our e-poll book system. So I hope that answers questions. How was your blood pressure that day? Oh, you know, <laughs> so uh, a little bit nerve wracking, but like I said, you, you do have backup plans. You do have, you know, I say this all the time and I don't think people realize that for county clerks, we got one shot at this and yeah. you have to be, you have to be able to pitch hit, you know, pinch hit for somebody and you gotta be able to call somebody and go, what would you do in this situation? We do that all the time because there isn't going to be an election that just goes smoothly for everybody, unfortunately. And so we have we have contingency plans all the time. I remember when Washakie County, the night before the election, the place, one of their places burned down and they jumped into action, moved it to another precinct and, you know, an area and then had to advertise that and get all the people. And it was successful. But it's because you do have to have a lot of backup plans. So. And thank you very much for all you've done. Probably. One one or two years that you've been doing this. One or two. And, and just to circle around and reemphasize the fact that the e poll book system is connected electronically to each other, to the central system, and that it had a hiccup um, because we were trying to overuse it, has nothing, nothing, nothing whatsoever to do with the, the integrity of ballots and voting machines. Totally two different Separate. things. And, and so uh, when people are in line and they hear there's a problem, they, they might think that there's a problem counting their ballots or there's a problem with their ballot secrecy or there's problems about the integrity of our election. Not at all, not at all, not even close. The Mr. problem Chairman. is that there is a, 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 a database system that is being constrained, but it's registration system. So, and Mr. Chairman, you. that's a good point that I had heard. I'd heard a lot of stuff during this time, but I had heard that our voting machines were down. Never were they down, ever. They were going like they were supposed to. So yeah, thank goodness for one, one part of the system. But Thank you, Clerk, please. Thank you for all Absolutely. you do, all of you. Um, Mr. Davis, where are we at? Mr. Irwin? Mr. Chairman, I'm finished with mine, unless if you have further questions. Any further questions? Mr. Irwin? Well, Mr. Chairman, let's talk about election equipment. To do that, Julie Fries, Fremont County Clerk. Excellent. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Julie Fries, Fremont County Clerk. And today I have uh, Margie Irvine, my chief deputy, and two of my election workers, Sarah McLean and Brianna Duenas. And um, they're going to be the Vanna Whites of our presentation. It's kind of a right. all here. So um, Again, I am Julie Fries, Fremont County Clerk. I have 45 years of experience in the election world in Wyoming. Uh, the first thing uh, that we have here is the use of the election equipment. I don't have to look up. Uh, the Board of County Commissioners, as you may or may not know, are in charge of usually purchasing your own um, equipment for your county. We've been very fortunate to have money come through the legislature and through HAVA to buy um, our systems, but those are owned by the county and in our possession and we have to insure them and yada, yada, yada. Um, the statutes establish requirements that the equipment vendors must adhere to, to even get these to be here to work with. Um, they have to have proof that the electronic voting system has been certified by the uh, 
EAC, which is the Election uh, Assistance Commission. And more importantly, they can decertify if the election voting system does not produce accurate results and reports as required by law. Accuracy is paramount and verified use, utilizing public tests of voting equipment and post-election audits. So the equipment we have in Wyoming, again, in 20, prior to 2020, uh, across the state, we had some varying systems uh, that were used across the state and their various vendors. Um, and then in 2019, the Secretary of State's office and the County Clerks Association had a pilot group, or I should say pilot group, a group of us um, that went and looked at three systems. And out of the three systems, we did choose um, ES and S on a number of different reasons. Uh, a lot of it, just so you know, a lot of their uh, equipment is uh, US made. Uh, the USBs were the only ones that were US made. And so some of those, uh, for some of us, were um, reasons we wanted to go for that. So we have the DS200s, which are here today. And we do have some pictures of all, all of these in your slides um, that from Malcolm here in just a minute. And there's a DS450 and a DS850, which are central count machines. You put them on there and they just roll through the entire thing. Those are good for uh, larger precincts that have absentee ballot counting in a separate location. And also it's great for recounts. Um, the ballot marking device, not to be confused with a voting device, is the express vote that we will demonstrate here in just a few minutes. So again, the tabulating equipment is the DS200, and it has a main, Margie, if you would come over, please. Uh, there's a main ballot collection box at the bottom. There's an auxiliary bin, which is the emergency bin that we, we heard about earlier. So if for some reason the power were to go out, um, we continue to vote. We would just make sure when they go to put their ballot into the machine, the machine's not working. We would tell them to double check their ballot for sure to make sure that they're they have voted everything they want to and didn't overvote something they didn't want to because the machine's not gonna tell them, obviously. They will put it in this slot here. And when we do come back up, uh, to a point where we can put it back through, then we will do that. Also, you asked about battery backup. We do have a two hour guaranteed backup battery, but generally those can go six to eight hours. Um, generally, you always wanna have your machines plugged in, but they can, if the power goes out for a little while. Again, contingency plans of generators and things like that are things that are in our, in our arsenal of things to fix. Um, there also is a clamshell that is just a cover that goes over the top of the machine here. All counties utilize the DS200s in some format. And of course, seal, 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 seals. You will see if you would take a tour of these machines, there's a lot of locations. The County Clerks Association worked on a uniformity document that said you must do these locations. If you want to do every seal that's on there after that, that's certainly up to you. Um, and each of our um, seals are uniquely numbered and temper evident, meaning if they were to be broken or if you pull them off, it will say void on them so that you will know they have been tampered with. And uh, Clerk Freeze, just one really simple question for the people that are looking. These actually aren't voting machines. These are tabulation. Tabulation, thank you. So people are voting on a paper ballot, which Correct. is always available. Uh, in, to, to look at. So Good these direction. are counting machines. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. But we will talk about handicap accessible yes. later. Okay. Yeah. Keep going. Uh, so inside the DS200, there's been a lot of discussion about modems versus non-modems. And I'm going to give you some ideas right now about modems or non-modems. You do have, um, in the back there, Margie, just indicated, we do put a seal with, it's called another auxiliary door. It's where a modem would be. They're absolutely empty, but we decided to seal them. They're never open. That is not a place you ever open. Um, if you also look inside of um, our machine, and you can see right here that little chip that says SIM card, that is a machine that has a modem. Ours do not, but if you were to see a machine inside, that's what you would be looking for. On the right-hand side in the red box, you will see that it says modem status detected. So your machine tells you that a modem is inside. If we go to the next slide, 
This is the equipment Wyoming has, and it is used in Wyoming. And if you open the top door, you'll see that that chip is no longer there. And on your report, it's going to say that it is not detected. And just for information wise, I know in my county, there was a Facebook post about why wouldn't county clerks check to make sure like with a wireless detector device, I said, great idea. I did that right before an election and there's nothing on our machines that are detected under a wireless detector device. Next slide. Okay, also inside the DS200, you will find that there is a public counter number, which is what we call like your trip permit. Trip permit. I'm thinking of my <laughs> husband today, apparently, or what, when he used to do trip permit. Uh, trip meter is what we're calling them. So that just tells you how many people voted in this election. Then there's a protected count, which we're calling the odometer, that gives you the lifelong uh, amount of ballots that have gone through this machine. The tabulating equipment that I'm talking about that is the central count, the 450, uh, these are the counties that do have those. They are not utilized at a polling location. And then the next one is an 850, which is in Natrona County. It's a little bit, it doesn't look bigger, but it's a bigger machine. Uh, maybe it runs a month, a little bit faster. And again, not utilized at a polling location. So you also have um, our, our uh, tape that runs out of every machine has a zero totals report and shows that no ballots have been cast. And it displays all the races that are to be tabulated on the machine. These are things our election judges must look at. And, and there's a lot more that they look at, but these for sure. Uh, the purpose is to ensure that you start with zero. Everybody starts with a zero before you start the election. On the, on the flip side, at the end of the day, your voting results report will show the number of ballots cast, display all the races again that are tabulated on that machine. And the purpose is to, do, uh, the, to balance the number of voters who checked in at the poll books, as Dale talked about earlier, and the number of ballots issued. So our poll books must match our numbers. In Fremont County, I, mean, I, I know we do it a little bit differently across the state. In Fremont County, you have a card and your ballot, you go vote your ballot or mark your ballot, you bring it over, you give up your card, and we we have a, even a sheet and you mark them on the sheet, and then you put your ballot through. And all during the day, I have a sheet for them to go around and say, how many do you have in your poll book? How many do you have on each machine that you have in, a, in an area? And how many do you have on your list? And how many cards do you have? They're just supposed to be doing that all day long. And that should balance all day long, and at the end of the day. And if it's not, then they need to write down, and it's good to have time periods so they can figure out, oh, remember the guy who got really angry and threw his stuff in the garbage can? And we go, yes, we remember, and that, that card's missing. You can actually go back and say, Julie Fries was really mad, and I see that her number here has not gone through the machine, and you set that aside going, okay, we know why we don't balance for that for that time frame. So that's, that's things that, that judges do at the polls. Next. Okay, on the um, express vote, this is the ADA compliant machine and it does have um, the little pad there for the, it has braille on it and it also has earphones. So um, in the vote center world, we must have these because I don't have every single Fremont County about now our machines and everything can hold the entire election, which is a good thing for our county. So those who don't have a regular paper ballot at the machine will vote on here and get a paper ballot, which we're going to show here in a minute. Um, if you had a voter that just is not understanding very well, sometimes we'll put, a, put them on a, an express vote so they can listen. Sometimes if you have somebody who keeps over voting and they keep coming back to get a new ballot, we'll send them to here because you can't over, over vote on this machine. So, um, Let's see, uh, well, let's go ahead and do our demo then. So Sarah here is going to be the voter and she gives up her card. On the card, it says what precinct that she is in. So she's gonna give up her card and the judge is going to find the precinct in the express vote after she puts her ballot in here, sorry. She will find the precinct that is on the card that is for her and in our county, we have the judge do this, but in other counties, there are some 
um, methods where they can actually scan your precinct right on to that card that went through there. And so that's already automatically done. And then here in Fremont County, we verify with the voter. It says Lander 1-1. I have selected Lander 1-1 and they verify, yes, that's what I got. So at this point, the voter would vote their selections and if they decided to change their mind, they could check another. I cannot. Oh, I can see what you're doing. Okay. They could That's one for their, Atman. I just saw it. <laughs> so they can uh, change their votes. And it won't let them overvote. And they can also uh, decide not to vote. So let's say they decided not to vote one of them. It will come up with a different color. Take it off. Yeah. Just hit the. You see, it's another color. So again, as a voter, you have the opportunity to look on the screen at the end and see what all you have voted for or not voted for, and you could change your mind. Say, I did want to vote for that, and so you can go back and do that. And again, you're going to get the whole list on the front, and then you're going to print it when you're ready, and you have one more chance to look at it because it's going to print that out on your ballot. We did give you copies and this, this is our slides. So the first one is showing you the screens and then the actual ballot that comes out of there. And for today's purposes of testing, we wanna make sure that we can test all of, all of our ballot styles or types. And so we have, usually we'll go and test all of these anyway. And we take one and we Take it out of the test deck, the regular one, and we just replace it so that we make sure that our test deck is still intact, which we'll be doing here after a little bit. Uh, Representative Wiley, welcome to Lander. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> um, will folks still have the, the ability to do a write-in? Mr. Ms. Chairman, Freaks. Representative. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, we had in that first one. Yeah, we'll go back and... Yeah, put it in. So it when she's doing this, um, there is an area. So you select the write-in area, and then it will come to a keyboard, and you can actually touch what you would like. Uh, we this actually this election that we did was for our Lander uh, fifth grade class for their citizenship. Mm. Uh, my granddaughter got me started in there last year, and they liked it so much. We came back this year, and so this is their fun ballot. And trust me, fifth graders do not like every select, you know, selection that we had. So they had to write in, of course. So uh, go ahead and write in whatever you want. Recess. Most of them did say recess, by the way. Okay, so then she would hit the cast. And then this time, just send the ballot around to them so they can see how the writing looks. And then... Um... If someone is disabled and can't work that machine, what happens then? And I forgot to mention also, if you have a sip and puff, you can actually do that. Um, and again, we talked about the, would you send that around? Um, we actually talked about the fact that if I come to vote and I'm not sure I can do it by myself, I can have someone of my choosing to help me with that. Mm -hmm. They can also choose an election judge. Um, the only thing I say to our election judge is make sure you're not shorthanded somewhere else when you do that. And um, and at that point, most of the things that we do is two judges of different parties, if you can. And that is one area. If they chose you to do that, that's their selection. Sometimes they don't bring somebody. Mr. Coach. In the beginning, you had a election judge selecting the precinct. Right. Um, I don't recall that happening when I voted. Is there a way that they, that can be pre-programmed? Is that, was that just unique to my right. county or? Uh, Mr. Chairman. It's funny, we talked about you yesterday. Oh, well. <laughs> I was told by Laramie County, he said, Chairman Olson is going to say that's not how it works. So as I mentioned, there is a, I think they have a scanner that actually marks that on their ballot and you just go put it through. I just found out about that. So we may be looking into that as well. Gotcha, okay. Thank you for that question. You just like went right into our. <laughs> you have just done very well in corporations. <laughs> we worked great. on this out in the hallway a minute ago. Well, keep going, please. Okay. We have. Uh, oh, sorry. Oh, Representative Op. I just wanted to yeah, just do a backup. When we, um, I went down to the original polling place where I was going to go because we have vote centers, um, and that 
didn't seem like it was going to work. I did go over to Arapaho and they in fact had this machine, I believe. And it was, it was smooth. And the people there, because it was different and the people there were extremely helpful. So they were apparently were well-trained. So it was successful. Very glad to hear that. Back okay. to you guys. So I think we are on to public test of voting equipment. Okay. Um, so for today, I know there's a slide for you guys here. First of all, um, we have to notify the chairman of every political party. And uh, on the general, the independents, they can have a representative come and watch. This is a, a public process if, if people want to. Um, usually we're in kind of small quarters, so to have very many people is kind of hard. But we do know, let them know ahead of time that we're going to be doing the test. And it is up to them whether or not they show up or not. So we're going to start at a specific time with or without people. I like to have them there. It's nice to know somebody is, has checked that out instead of questions later. Um, just so you know, testing in Fremont County in the primary took two and a half days. So that's how much time your people would need to spend with us um, to do that. So um, why does it take so long? Is it because of the because complexity? Of the absolutely every machine with the entire county's election. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it takes a while. It's so not one out of one of every type of ballot in Every, every machine every, in the primary and it's like every party, you yeah. know, in the Think municipalities the and every every scenario. We had I mean, how many ballots? Uh, 155 ballot styles. And then how many machines? We had 20, 27. So do the math. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So uh, we have presented again. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Clerk Freeze. Is that an average for a county to have 155 different ballots? No. <laughs> larger, We're special. Larger counties, <laughs> larger counties, obviously. So. Right, uh, remember, we have one or two school districts. Yeah. And remember, we have county commissioner districts and uh, quite a few legislative okay. districts split. Yeah. and uh, several municipalities okay. with each one uh, having districts and municipal officers. So it is kind of complicated. Uh, so what we do is we get what's called a test deck that is performed for us usually by your, um, by the printer, sorry, Marcy, or the ESMS. The test deck is done by our printer or ESMS, our printer. And so what that is, it's predetermined of, you wanna make sure that every, um, Candidate gets a ballot and we'll be doing that here in just a second. Um, but you wanna make, make sure of several things is that everybody gets a ballot or a count on their, uh, as a candidate and proposition and some other things that we will do. Um, and then on put completion of that, we're going to put a lot of seals on this. So we'll jump into exactly what we do when we go to testing. So when you come to testing in Fremont County, and again, you are seeing Fremont County's testing. If you've been somewhere else, we have the levity to do whatever we need to do to feel comfortable about our testing. There are the uniformity things that I'm gonna show you today that have to be done um, in some fashion. So the first thing we do in Fremont County to begin with, our warehouse is several blocks from the courthouse. So obviously anybody coming into a situation that is not an authorized user of our machines have to sign a chain of custody form. And that's your picture number two, on our slide. And then when we start the day, we already have started the DS200 to speed it up for you. That's all we did is turn it on and make sure the zero tape comes out. And that is picture number three on my slide. We let all the representatives see that there are zeros and we leave the tape on each machine because we want the entire process to stay on the machine. And while they're doing that, again, the test deck must do the following, you must make sure every candidate and question on the ballot gets a vote. Uh, we wanna make sure that a write-in can be performed on those. And these, are you, you have a ball. Oh, okay. If there's any questions while we're waiting for the zero tape, I apologize, we're trying to make it quick for you, but this is reality as it does take time. You're doing great. 
really, it's a good presentation, so. Okay, so what they're going to do is do exactly what I was talking about is making sure at this point that every uh, candidate on the ballot and proposition is getting a vote. Um, and for those who have helped with that in Fremont County, I imagine this is very similar across the state. Usually it's like a one, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, you know, something like that, that is kind of similar. Um, and then you're ready. Okay. And you want to make sure that um, it recognizes a blank ballot, which you also have on page four, a picture. And it's going to tell you on the screen that you have a blank ballot and that there are options. Of course, at the polls, we would want to encourage the voter to take it back out. Why would you have a blank ballot potentially? There's a couple of reasons. They've circled the name. They don't read directions. They circle the name, and that's why we're in the schools, because they're really good at following directions. But uh, they circle the name, or they didn't really fill it in very good. And so the machine is saying, I can't read this. It, it seems to be a blank to me. So some of these cases, they could take the ballot right back out and use it. But if they're feeling really funky about that, they can come back, they can spoil the ballot and get a new one. Um, why else would somebody put a blank ballot? Some people said, you know, I absolutely want nothing on this ballot, but I don't want to get dropped off your list. So I'm going to vote for nobody. <laughs> so I guess that's a vote telling you they didn't like anybody. So in this case, we yeah, wanted yeah. to show undervotes. And does everybody understand undervotes? Or should I probably go through that? Go undervotes through, meaning sure. that you can vote for up to two, for example. You choose to vote one, or you can vote for one. You choose not to vote for them, which is an option for anybody. You don't have to vote for everything on the ballot. And so in those locations, it's going to show an undervote. And we want to make sure that the machine is going to tell us that. OK, we also make sure the machine recognizes an overvoted ballot. And again, at the polls, you definitely want to have your voter look at it and say, maybe I would like to go and spoil my ballot and try again. But it will tell you on the screen and it shows you on your picture here. It tells you which um, races that you overvoted. It tells you how many you voted for and how many you're allowed to. So you can go back and look at that ballot and see what you did wrong. We do want to cast the ballot at this time because we want to, again, make sure that it's going to show up on our tape that this was an overvoted ballot. So the question might be, if I overvoted one race, is that going to invalidate my entire ballot? No, it is not. So it's only going to invalidate that, that section. So if you didn't want to vote for dog catcher and you wanted to, you know, and or you thought you wanted yes and no or two people or whatever, then you're going to have the overvote there. That's the only one for overvote. You also want to make sure that multiple ballots won't go through. And it's going to tell you, again, there's on page five, the multiple ballot um, error. And it's going to tell you, please try them one at a time. And it's these stick together. So it's it's good to try that just so you your judges aren't surprised of what that's going to look like. And you want to run the express vote that we talked about ballot. You want to run it, make sure it'll go through the machine and tabulate correctly. And that is um, number six, picture number six. At this point, the county clerk staff will confirm the public count number every time a set of test ballots is put through the machine, which you have to skip a page for just a second to page eight. And why would we do that is because we talked about how many ballots that we might have to run through. So there, each precinct is in their own little folder. And in the folder, at the top of the folder, it'll say how many ballots were to go through that machine. So in this case, we ran 14, it says you should have run 14. So the staff is going to confirm, because we usually have our representatives run these through, it's really good for them to see the whole process. So then we're gonna make sure that when we get to the second precinct, if there's another 14 ballots, it will say, it will add them up. So now you should have 28. And we just, we keep that running to make sure that all of your ballots have run through so your test will be accurate, okay? In the USB access panel area, this is where your USB is, which is where your election is, is in that USB. This machine is nothing but a big garbage can if you have that, if you don't have that USB in there. Press the close poll button and the results tape will print from each machine. And again, we're going to keep this intact because I want a record of, of zeros and then results. And then we're going to come up with zeros again. When they're done here, we will have them turn off the machine. 
And you want to make sure all your machines are tested, of course, so you might move on to the next one or you may be doing several at a time. We are fortunate enough to have three staff generally, um, and we had several representatives. So even though it still took us two and a half days, we would do a set on each machine that we had available um, until they were done. We also have to test the central count machines that you saw. So we eventually have to take those same test decks and run them through that and get our USB from that as well. And not, again, we talked about our warehouse being far away from the courthouse, but maybe everybody else is a little more, maybe they have it inside their courthouse. But once we pull the USB, a new chain of custody must follow the um, USB because now it's a separate piece and it's gonna go to the, for us, it's gonna go to the courthouse. And so we don't want whoever's taking it over to the courthouse to have any access to it. So the key is left at the warehouse when they get done. And then um, when we get to the courthouse, we have the other set of keys for them over the courthouse where we can open them to go to the next process. So if you look at page, Eleven. So we are going to run all USB media for unofficial results. So that would be the same as we do on election night. We want to make sure everything's working. The representatives, everybody uh, can come clerk, to see that. Clerk Freese, you, you said page eleven. Yes, yeah, the picture of inserting the USB, so you can see it. That's our computer. We don't have the computer here today. I, I think we have a different paging system. Oh. oh, okay. Thank you. This one. Sorry. Oh, no worries. Appreciate it. And on the right hand side, you will see uh, where it tells us on the computer screen that we're going to load our results, start the load. Um, representatives and the county clerk or staff will look at the outcomes report, which comes with your test deck that says this is what should show up on the test deck report. And you have the report that comes off election where to make sure that they match. And generally what we do is one person is reading it and the representatives are following along and making sure that what you're reading is actually what's coming up on the report. After we know that all of these are good, we return the USB media to the DS200 machines. And again, if we're going back to our warehouse, we have to do the USB uh, chain of custody and the bag and everything. Um, and we take them back and we put them into the DS200 machines and they are specific to a machine. So you have to make sure that you put them back into the serial number, which is listed on our USBs. So each USB goes to one machine. Yes, that's correct. Gotcha. Your wire still? It's gone. Oh. <laughs> so we're going to put it back in the machine and we're going to wire seal them now into the DS200 so that no one can take them out. And you're going to, uh, we also on the side here, I don't know if you can see on the side of the express votes is also, um, again, this is only a marking device, but we don't care. The USB for the election is in there and it is also uh, wire sealed. We make sure that these are on, um, this is page 13. We make sure that they are on, um, the numbers are on the certificate for each machine we're going to put on there. And so that is picture number 14. Okay. And the, at this point of time, the county um, staff sets the machine back to zero. And then we, we are not going to do that for the interest of time. So, um, but we do have the county and the representatives see the beginning zeros, the results, and then the ending zeros. And then this, the representatives and the clerk sign off or initial the tapes and date them. And they are saved with the test ballot um, package. And now it's time to seal each voting machine. And on each machine, there is a bag that we put that has everything. It has the machine sheet and has every seal that's going to go on this machine. And our staff marks wherever they're supposed to go. So it makes it easier. Again, our representatives are always helping with this as well. Um, and that machine certificate, like I said, is number 14. This group of people will make sure that the public count is zero and the protective count they need to write down on 
the um, machine sheet as well. Before closing the clamshell, the county staff will place a label seal on top of the USB access door and across the auxiliary door behind the screen. So remember the access door. So we've sealed inside with a wire seal. We have sealed the USB to the machine. Now we are locking and closing that. And we are putting a seal, which we are putting like a label seal. All of these have numbers and all of these are being checked on this uh, sheet. And we're going to uh, make sure again that there's, if anybody's tampering, we will, there's two methods, to, I mean, to get to it, you have to go through two things. You get it? Not a lot of room inside that. Okay. So put the seal on that. And then they would close the front, front lid. And again, we talked about the auxiliary door on the back again where the modem would be no matter what we have decided that we want that's a uniformity thing we're all putting a seal on that one too okay now you would close the ds200 machines and place the seals on the front bin front of the bin to the clamshell and we had already put on the side seals but you're going to double check the serial numbers on the or the numbers on those and then you are done with this machine. And so now we are going to replace this machine with a properly sealed machine. So can I interrupt oh, for a second? Can I back up on that one just a second, Margie? Sorry, I forgot it. I'd like to ask Senator Boner a question because it looks like it might be easier to launch a nuclear missile than it is. To do this. <laughs> well, and that's it. I did have the opportunity to uh, uh, do the um, Equipment audit with the Commerce County Clerk actually reminded me of my first staff job where we would go through and verify the numbers in this case for, well, it was basically the document that translated to this war plan for our nuclear war plan and into, you know, the, you have to translate that into launch this missile, that missile, that missile, that target with this delay time we had to go through and make sure that document was accurate and make sure that drive with the uh, U.S. Strategic Command and it, it kind of took me back to you know <laughs> my, my times as a young Air Force captain, because we were just looking there, you know, going over numbers and uh, making sure they matched up. So, yeah, there's lots of similar procedures with the, uh, uh, we call them TDIs, tamper detection indicators. They were basically uh, not meant to prevent uh, tampering, but to identify it. And we put that, we had 20 of them over our sensitive components in our launch control center. So, yeah, lots of similarities here. Um, not the exact same, but a lot of similarities, yeah. Interesting. So I forgot, we want to make sure we open the front of this machine and we want to take those ballots out that we put in there. Obviously, we don't want, we don't want them to show up sometime yeah. down the road. <laughs> we don't want those to show up anywhere. So we make sure that those are removed. And inside, I don't know that every county uses this, but the, there is a tote and they hold a thousand ballots. So we're going to make sure again that it's empty, even those we're sitting on top. Usually during testing, we don't put these in here. So it's much easier to get them out. And then at this point in Fremont County, we do not lock the front door just because I'm sending nothing of interest in the bottom. But some counties may decide to send their uh, blank ballots up to the polls. You definitely want to lock and seal those. Um, there's also another method to get these to the polling um, area. So some counties, like this is how we will send our entire uh, equipment to the county, to each one of our county um, vote centers. However, there are some counties that have to deliver so many days in advance and they didn't like the knowing that their machine is out somewhere. And so they do have a way that they, um, they take off the machine part of it and they put it in a, a bag or a container, which they can also seal and their head judge has to check that out and take it on election day. So otherwise they just put that part up. But in Fremont County, this is how you would see it at the polls. Okay, um, we want to make sure that, let's see, I don't want to forget something. Okay, the county clerk and representative will sign this machine certificate and place it in the keys in the red secure bag, which is, we talked about picture number 14. Uh, the county clerk staff will fill out the certificate of all seals for all machines, which is your picture number 15. And the county clerk uh, staff and representatives will review that and sign it. And a copy of the certificate by law is required to go to the Secretary of State. And some counties actually give a copy to the um, to the um, party representatives 
uh, the chairman usually we send that to them if, if, um, if they would like to have that. And again, the machines are ready to go to the polling place. So now we're going to fast forward to um, delivery to the polling place. So now we're done with testing and we're moving into a different area. Hey, can I uh, on testing? Can I pull you guys about when it would be appropriate for the committee to take a break and everybody? I mean, just by way of what you got going. I, I think, Mr. Chairman, that we're fairly close on equipment. Okay, I that would be. I think it'd be close. Yeah. All right. Let's okay. we'll plan on that. So Thank you. Um, again, getting ready to take these to the polls. There's a chain of custody that goes with every machine. Uh, delivery personnel will receive equipment from the county clerk staff, and they'll sign off and take custody of the of the equipment to deliver, and they'll take the chain of custody document. Delivery personnel will deliver the equipment to the polling location and get a signature of the person receiving the equipment. And we do have agreements with all of our polling locations. And one of the things is we ask for a secure location, but I kind of like my own camera system to make sure I can access whatever I, whenever I want. So we bought game cams and these last were a really, really long time. We, whenever they're delivered, they're turned on at that point. And I could tell you if anybody's even been around the machines, which is a comfort to me. Okay, fast forward now election day. So now here we are election day and we're going to have a head judge and two uh, judges here. So the red security bag that we've been talking about has the following in information in it. The keys to the voting machine and the express votes and the machine certificate. And it is locked and this key to the bag is placed in a secure container that gets delivered with the machine. This bag is the, re is the requirement of the main manager or head judge to pick it up and uh, have it before election day. So a lot of them are either the night before or the morning of election and they bring it and they have the key out of the secure container at work. So again, even when they're at home, they have no access to any of the stuff. They get the key and they're going to give it to uh, them. In this case, they're going to get all the keys out for the machines and they're gonna give them to the machine judges who is going to pull out that machine certificate and they're going to compare the serial number and polling location on top of the machine to their certificate and they're going to compare the seals on the front and side of the machine to make sure that they have not been tampered with and they are still there and take that camera off we do not we don't shut it off, but we actually put them underneath the machine. We won't go that way today, but um, we don't want to be videotaping any of our voters in Fremont County. So unlock the clamshell shell to the bin and check the auxiliary seal to the machine certificate. They keep every seal. They are required to keep every seal after they open it as well. Okay, and we're going to check the auxiliary is the same number that we had it. Unlock and lift the monitor screen, and the machine should start up, and the tape will begin automatically. Okay, so they're going to take off the USB access door, and they will check inside there to make sure that that matches their certificate. And they will um, then they relock that door because this should go on its own. They're going to open the front bottom door and check to make sure that tote is empty. While she's sitting there, because she should go. Thank you. This is really good. And they'll put it back in the machine. And this time, instead of putting it in and leaving the lids closed, we're going to open the lids. Trust me, the first judge that calls and goes, I don't know what's going on. I've already feel like I filled the machine. Generally, they have not done this step. So uh, make sure that's open. Then they're going to lock. And at this point, we're going to seal it with a wire seal. You don't have to do that there we'll, for interest of time. When all your machines are up and running, we return the keys to the main manager. They don't need to be over here at all. 
All machine judges make sure the tapes are zero for every candidate and proposition, just like we did in testing. And this time they're gonna pull it off and they're going to sign and date it. And that is gonna go in the red bag. Now, fast forward to the end of the day. So don't worry about it. Um, we're going to close the polls. Judges check all day long with poll book judges that they are balanced and they make sure all voters have voted. Judges announce the polls are closed and anyone who is not a judge must leave at this time. Machine judges should get the keys from the main manager and open the USB access door and press the close poll button. The tape prints out the unofficial results. All judges sign and the results tape, all judges sign the results tape and give to the main manager to place in the red secure bag. After results are finished, they turn off the machine, cut the wire seal on the USB and remove the USB media and they get the chain of custody again for the USB and they sign it and place both of them in the red security bag. The main manager or head judge will get the security bag to the person delivering and have and hold the hold the bag hold the bag key by placing it in the secure container at the poles. They will cut the seal on the front door and close the lid of the tote. You don't have to do that. We're just going to close the lid of the tote and we're going to lock and we're going to wire seal or label seal that as well, put it back in and wire seal again. Some counties require them to bring all those ballots back to the polls. Uh, we are not, um, we don't do that in Fremont County. It's a lot to bring back. You lock and seal across that tote and write the seal number. The delivery of the results, the main judge makes sure the delivery person signs the chain of custody to the USB before they close the security bag and lock it. The, the secure red bag key stays with the main manager and the locked secure red bag is given to the election judge or law enforcement officer to deliver. The county clerk staff will open the bag with their key and sign the secure or sign the chain of custody. The USB is inserted into election wear like you saw before to get the results and that would be the unofficial results. The USB media that has been loaded goes into a secure container and the chain of custody form is retained by the clerk. The unofficial report also goes to the Secretary of State in the formats they have determined in a secure email. And Secretary of State will contact us by phone to assure it was received and they will verify the top five races that what we sent to them really is what is on our reports. The list of voter numbers is also sent to the Secretary of State at this time for them to determine the post-election audit list, which will come at a later date. So that would be the the whole thing with the machines and one quick one, then we have post audit, uh, post election audits. So the post election audit that comes, uh, the list from Secretary of State, which must be done at least one day before the state canvas. Um, this is where we uh, look and we have a crop or a picture for you. This is the most wanted pictures in Wyoming right now is what does that post election audit look like? So the first one that I have for you here shows that on the left-hand side, this is how the machine voted the ballot on the right-hand side. The second picture that we have is it shows again how the machine voted it, but we have a write-in. And I just want to mention that one of the reasons this has been since a very sensitive topic about whether or not you would retain the privacy of a voter is you would have to be in our job to understand what I'm going to say next. But if there is distinctive writing for, I'm sure there's distinctive writing on this panel. We, we kind of hope we could play that here, but it takes too long to do that. But you could almost see or know in a certain situation, like a split precinct that maybe only has three Democrats in it and only one person voted and they wrote write-ins. I mean, like, uh, yeah, we can, we know how they voted the rest of their ballot. Maybe you don't care about the write-in, but um, so that's why this has been just a, the county clerk and a representative from each party looking at those. These have these in the last election were 100% accurate. And then there's the 5% where you do 5% of your voting. Uh, you do the test deck like we showed you earlier. You would do that on 5% of your machines that were used at the polls. That's to show that your voting machines still are accurate and still are working. And we at Fremont County, we try to do that at the campus. I think there's several counties that do that, but we have 30 days to do that one. Thank you for, I know, a long drawn out process. Right. So Senator Landon and Senator Scott. 
Clerk Freeze, if I wanted to fill out two ballots, how would I do it? We will and catch you. I go to jail, sir. Yeah. Uh, Senator Scott. Final tabulations of, of the uh, votes. Um, it strikes me that the difference between test decks and the actual counting of, of votes is one, you're dealing with much larger volume. <laughs> And second, the general public has handled the individual ballots. So you have nothing else, the prospect of stray marks being made on them either on purpose or accidentally. Coffee stains. Uh, you know, there's things that can happen. Um, when you have to say recount the votes, do you actually see any discrepancies? And if so, what's the level of them? from one count to the other? Does, does the machine always produce the same count or are there one or two vote differences or what is the order of magnitude of any difference? Mr. Chairman, Clerk Senator Scott, um, I know at the last election, um, we did a recount. It, was a, it wasn't an automatic recount. It was a recount, recount requested by the candidate. And I know Park County did one and both of those were completely accurate to what the, unoffic or the, the unofficial results. Well, actually at that point, it's the official results. So, so confirm the original ones, 100%. Yes. And then if you have a spoiled ballot, which you, kind of your question started out, um, uh, that's going to be caught when it's attempted to be read, right? And then so the first person would get a chance to do another ballot. So Mr. Chairman, again, your election judges are strictly um, trained that mm -hmm. when someone comes back with the example of overvoting, so they come back and say, I guess I overvoted my ballot. We have them mark their own ballot spoiled, or if they want to put it in a million pieces, we don't care. We have an envelope that they put them in and we write on the outside, you know, we had Lander 1-1, one, one, one spoiled. And then we re retrieve another ballot for them, initial it, get their card all back together. And it's like they start all over again. They should never show up with two here. And if they do, they should be sent back to the head judge to determine why that ever happened. I've not had that happen that I'm aware of. Right. So uh, I represent that. Is there ever a situation where the physical ballot is ever used? So I know the audit uses um, the images basically, but is there ever in a challenge or anything where a physical ballot's needed? to be used for a count or for an audit? Ms. Fries? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative Knapp, um, I'd, I have never been involved where somebody asked for a specific ballot. So first of all, I don't know which one's your ballot. I'm not gonna be able to find it. The way these numbers come up on, the, it's called a spray on the on the ballot where we give these numbers to the Secretary of State. I, I don't, I can't see those, so I could not, and if even if I could, I mean, at a vote center, especially, I have every precinct possible being, you know, voting in our area. That would be very difficult to find that. It would be, I know a lot of people want that. They want to see the actual ballot. But if we have months to look for it, I guess, and have a way to look for it, I guess that would be a possibility. But right now, I see no way to look at it. Okay. So if we take a break now. Do you guys need more time when we come back? Yes, Mr. Chairman, if that's okay. We, yeah, we know we've got a couple we're of make more this seconds. Work. We may be carrying some stuff over this. Afternoon. Let's take a break till 11 o'clock and then come back. Um, I went to school here and the restrooms are down the two halls there. This was my lunchroom and my band room. Yeah, the, be forewarned. You're all very tall right now. Absentee ballot, yeah. I know. We'll see what happens. Which is fine. We have a. It's kind of a sloppy day. afternoon. Yeah. That's good. So we got an extra forty-five. It may take an extra hour or something. This is really good. This is good stuff. So we should take our time.
All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's move to our seats. I'm getting a, I'm getting a finger from the chief clerk of the house, but it's not the finger you're thinking of.
Katie, we okay? Okay, so we're live on Zoom and we're gonna pick up and Mr. Irwin, are you coordinating this part of the show? <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I'll start. Um, and we are on the downhill stretch, by the way. Ms. We're, Bartlett, We're welcome. coming to an end, thank you. Gwen Bartlett, Carbon County Clerk. Um, I have 26 years of election administration experience and starting my fifth term as county clerk. With me is um, Lisa Smith. She has 20 years of election administration, as well as Clerk Murphy. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> but they're all relevant. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about absentee voting. Um, there's a couple different ways to vote absentee. We're going to start with the traditional way where you're folding up your ballot, you're putting it in an envelope, and it's remaining sealed until it's processed um, at or near election day. And then a little later on, Clerk Murphy will talk about the early in-person voting because carbon doesn't do that. Um, Laramie, Teton Park, and a host of other counties do. We have tried it in the past. However, it just wasn't, um, wasn't as efficient for us. We don't have that many voters. We only had a couple hundred that really wanted to vote in the office. The rest like to take their ballot home in Carbon County or have it mailed to them for whatever reasons. So in both scenarios though, we have a record of the life of the ballot, both in Wild Reg and on their voter register, sorry, on their um, absentee ballot request form. And so we can always refer back to those. So on slide 49- Introduce yourself again. Sorry. Lisa Smith, Carbon County Election Deputy. Welcome. Mr. Chairman, um, on slide 49, requesting an absentee ballot, you can see that only qualified electors can vote by absentee. Requests can be made any time throughout the year. Often we get requests starting in January for all elections, but sometimes a snowbird may request a ballot for only the November election. Um, someone may register and vote absentee at the same time. Um, Party changes must be completed prior to the first day of candidate filing in mid-May. And then on the right-hand side of the slide, you can see the absentee ballot request form. So the voter either completes that form themselves or we reduce it to writing per their phone request or email request. Um, we compare that information from the application to the voter's wire ridge record. And then any necessary changes such as um, name, address, party affiliation changes if prior to the deadline um, would need to be completed on a voter registration form. And then once verified, we enter that request into WireRidge um, and then either scan or file that request form. And then if we are issuing a ballot at the same time and the voter is present, they must show the acceptable um, ID to vote. On slide number 50, um, delivering absentee ballots, UACAVA or um, overseas citizens, active military, their spouses and dependents, those individuals can receive their absentee ballot 45 days prior to the election. And then all other absentees um, will be issued 28 days prior to the election. Um, absentees entered into WireReg earlier in the year are held until time to issue. And then when we issue those ballots, we print labels, um, from WireRidge that are placed on the Secretary of State supplied envelopes. There's an inner envelope with the affidavit that the voter will sign and an outer envelope used to mail the ballot. And you do have a sample of this on the table in front of you. So you have, um, and these all have my name on it, by the way, obviously, for demonstration purposes. Um, and insider, they, they prearranged so that they're voting for you too? <laughs> I'm not on the ballot this time, thankfully. Okay. I didn't have to run this year. <laughs> go ahead. Um, but you do have the inner envelope that we're going to be talking about with the affidavit portion and then the signature line in yellow. It's one of the main things that we're looking for as clerks when we get that back to make sure that that's completed and signed. You would also have instructions every voter would have if it's mailed to you, as well as your, your ballot, which there's a sample ballot in there, just for, again, for demonstration purposes, so you can see if you've never voted that way. I'm on slide 51, talking about returning of the absentee ballot. Obviously, the voter's going to vote their ballot, place it inside the envelope. They're going to seal it, complete the um, affidavit if it's not already completed for them, and sign it. Once we get those back as clerks, we're looking for that signature to make sure that the voter has signed it. If not, we're chasing them down the hall, we're calling them, we're mailing them, we're emailing them, you know, trying to get them to come back because without that signature, we cannot count that ballot. Um, as time allows, we're doing all of those things. We date and timestamp each ballot 
and we enter them as received in WireReg. So each of us has a record in WireReg. It shows that Gwen Bartlett has an outstanding ballot um, or an active ballot is exactly what it says. And as that comes back, we mark Gwen's record that her ballot has already been received. If it hasn't come back, um, we'll get to that in a minute, how it shows at the polls so that the judges know that that person has or has not voted. These again, remain um, sealed in the envelope until we process them later on, either the Thursday or Friday before election day or on election day. They're organized by precinct typically. I think that's how we do it in Carbon County. And I would assume every other county does it the same. So in case we needed to pull one back out for any kind of um, proof purposes or to tell a voter that we had received it back. Um, we reconcile these daily. So in Carbon County, people are coming and bringing these in. We're, we're putting them in a sealed container. And then at the end of the night, we're gathering those up, counting them, comparing them to how many we've received back in Wild Ridge. Um, and in Carbon County, they're kept in a very secure location. And I know they are as well um, throughout the state. For us, that means a secured room with limited access in a locked cabinet um, under two high definition cameras. <laughs> Um, and still remember at this point, we're only talking about these traditional absentees that are being held in the envelope. So we'll get to the early in person here in just a second. On slide number 52, processing absentee ballots, any ballot received late is marked rejected and those are not counted. And we do not go by a postmark date. Um, to process ballots, um, clerks can either, del either del deliver those absentee ballots to the precinct polling places or designate an absentee counting board of at least three individuals of different party affiliations. And then ballots can be processed um, early on either the Thursday or Friday prior to election day or on election day. Ballots are tabulated or counted at the close of the polls on election day. And we'll explain what processing means here in just a minute. If processing early, which is the 30, Thursday or Friday before, um, then there are statutory requirements that must be met. Um, the clerk must notify the Secretary of State's office, notify each political party chair of the date, time, and location that will be doing that early processing. Um, no candidate, the candidate's committee chair or treasurer are allowed to observe the process. No results shall be known until after the polls close on election day. Nobody in the room um, can have any electronic devices within 10 feet of the processing areas, and that includes phones, cameras, laptops, et cetera. And then the Secretary of State shall um, adopt rules for this processing. So remember the whole 10 feet discussion, it was a concern by the legislature when you adopted um, the process for, for the early processing that we didn't want anybody with a camera or to be able to see those, those results and have anything get out. So that's the reason for that 10 feet. I want to hop back really quick to the postmark date too, because I've heard discussion of that over the years of, you know, why couldn't we go by a postmark date? If you remember in the timeline discussion, Malcolm mentioned how many days was it between the primary when we, 15 days that we have. I mean, somebody could postmark it the day of the election. And if we get it a week later, we already have to have ballots to our printer by that point, right? So that it, it just doesn't work. So we go by the received date. Um, so the different and ways to that's uh, by seven o'clock on election day. 7 p.m. on election day okay. that it needs to be in our office. Yeah. Yep. Um, the different ways to count absentee ballots, Lisa kind of touched on it. So you can deliver those absentee ballots to the polling places. Um, I don't, I'm not aware of any counties doing that. I think there may be one. Um, there's already sworn judges there that would process them and count them the same way um, as we do at the office. Or we can have an absentee counting board that's appointed. Again, she mentioned that that was um, bipartisan teams of people in the office. So we're gonna demonstrate how that's done. So the first thing we're doing is we're gonna have a stack of envelopes. We're looking at them all, which these aren't signed, but we're gonna look at them, make sure that they're all signed. We're gonna balance these. So we're gonna print a poll book just as we would if we were at a polling place. And we're gonna mark that Gwen's ballot was received back and it shows received. And then we're gonna to go to the next one and the next one and the next one. So they're reconciled daily. And then yet again, on election day or when, when they're being processed the Thursday or Friday before. So we're gonna pretend we're a team of three judges. The first one's gonna open the envelope. And I think this is just important to show, you know, how fast we're trying to go. The second one is separating the envelope. So this person can't see whose ballot it was, not even looking at it. Um, the third person is simply unfolding those, flattening them and preparing them to run through a machine. In some counties, they may be running through a DS-200 as what was demonstrated for you here today. And in others, they may go through that larger 450 or the 850. 
you can stack those up like this and set the whole stack on those larger machines and it runs them all through um, at the same time, if that makes sense. So this is exactly what happens um, when people are processing ballots out of envelopes. When we're finished with these, we're going to ban these. We know that there was 10. She's gonna run them through a machine. There should be 10, a count of 10 on whatever machine that is. We will ban them up together and we will place them in a sealed container and they're held there until canvassing time unopened. And that seal is obviously noted on a, um, a log. The ballots have a chain of custody log. And yeah. <laughs> so to ensure that nobody can vote more than one ballot, the following safeguards are in place. So there are times when a voter might call and say they never received their first absentee ballot in the mail or that they've damaged it, like they've spilled coffee on it. We get a lot of those. Um, or that they've sent it back to us, but verified that they we haven't received it. So in these scenarios, we can issue a replacement absentee ballot to those individuals. And you might remember earlier, we explained how um, we go into the voter's record, while Reg rec record, and we receive the ballot back and mark it as received. If someone sent back a second ballot, while Yo Reg would not allow us to receive that second ballot back. And then in that case, we would date and time stamp it, mark it rejected, and it would never be tabulated. In addition, there are two types of poll books that Dale talked about earlier. There's the paper poll books and the e-poll books. On e-poll books, Yo Reg is accessed in real time to know if a voter has returned their absentee ballot, um, and therefore the judge would not allow that person to vote a second ballot. On a paper poll book, as shown in the slide, um, an A is printed next to voters who have requested absentee ballots, and then they have a different status listed, either sent or received. So a received status means that that ballot was, absentee ballot was received back in our office and marked into IRH. And if the voter shows up at the polls, um, that voter is not allowed to vote again a second time. A sent status means that the ballot was sent, but at the time the poll book was printed that that ballot hadn't been received in our office. In that scenario, the election judge would call the county clerk's office and verify that we ha indeed have not received a ballot back. If that is verified, then um, the clerk's office would cancel that absentee ballot and they would allow that individual to go ahead and vote at the polls. And then if that person tried to go back over to the clerk's office and turn in their absentee ballot, we'd be like, uh, no, we've already heard for about <laughs> heard from you today, <laughs> heard about you, we've and we've canceled it. And then that would also prevent them from voting a second time. Mm. Does that make sense? Do you all see the statuses on the poll book in your sample, the sent and received? Definitely. And in the situation where the e poll book is not live, then it would be the same. It they still would work, they right? They couldn't vote twice. They could not vote. They would just have to call and verify that that ballot had not been received, that it's not in hand, and they could still cancel that absentee ballot request. So gotcha. Mr. Okay. Chairman, when the e poll book is not live, you can simply think of it as a paper poll book. Yeah. And it's, so you check marks there. Yep. Senator Scott. Locked auto accident, heart attack, and the planned operation is bad. Somebody dies. What's what's the policy? You count all those absentee votes at some point. I think you have to. Mr. Chairman, Senator Scott, uh, Go ahead. we do count those, and that has happened in Carbon County. There was a felony conviction, I think, between the time. Um, but we consider the day that they turned that into our office their election day. Um, and if they were eligible to vote on that day, then that is that is their election day. And we do count those. Once they're already received back in our office, then it's counted. Thank you. Yes. Keep going. Um, so again, we talked about traditional ab absentees. I'm gonna let Clerk Murphy talk a little about the early in-person voting um, as she does that in her county. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Maureen Murphy, Teton County Clerk. 
And there are numerous counties um, in Wyoming who do practice early in voting, absentee voting. It, Wyoming doesn't differentiate in our definitions of early voting. So I always like to include in-person um, absentee voting. So in our county, we now we will go to 28 days before the election. Um, we are open. It is just like election day. The voter comes in, shows their ID, gets actually, I believe you all have a copy of the affidavit that they get that says um, they sign their oath. They say, this is where I live. Um, and then they vote in person. So they'll fill out their ballot in person and vote it in a machine. That machine does not, none of the totals of that machine get run until after 7 p.m. on election night. Um, we have a high population in Teton County that does like to vote this way. I think we had almost 3,000 voters out of 10 vote early in person um, this year. So counties can or cannot choose to do that. Um, we also have the process, um, some counties do it differently, where if a voter comes in and requests an absentee ballot the traditional way, they can take it with them and either return it to our office or um, mail it back. They cannot bring that absentee ballot back to us and run it through the machine after they've voted, after they've taken it away. They can come back in, we can cancel that ballot and they can get an, and spoil it and get a new one and run it through the machine. Um, but that we, we don't allow that. Um, and then at the end of the day, Hold on, we're going to have, yeah, yeah. Go ahead, let's sit, finish your thought at the end of the day. Okay, at the end of the day, we take the number of affidavits that we have and balance it to the number of votes cast, and that's how we balance each night. Okay, thank you. Senator Landon. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, but I want to come back to, to bringing a, a ballot in that you provided, and instead of dropping it in the mailbox, they decide, well, we're going back to town, so I might as well drop it by the office. Why would that ballot not be good? It is good if they, if they Go return ahead. it. Oh, sorry, Mr. Chair, Senator Landon, it is good if they return it in the envelope to us, but they can't take that ballot that they voted off site and run it through the machine. So it's got to be in the envelope with the seal and everything, and they know it's a good ballot. Yeah. All mm -hmm. right, keep going. That's it. We're well, good. Mr. Irwin? Mr. Chairman, I think that is all we have on absentee ballots, unless there's questions. Questions on absentee mm -hmm. ballots? Okay. Thank you very much. Very good. Mr. Chairman, when we were preparing this, we almost cut this section out about provisional ballots, but our discussion was, we doubt any of you have ever voted provisionally. And so we found it important that we leave this in. And so um, really quickly about provisional ballots, we talked earlier that a um, an election judge has an obligation to challenge a voter if they believe that they don't, uh, they're not qualified. And to uh, Representative Yin's question earlier about that voter who shows up, forgot their ID, doesn't want to drive all the way back to Bates Creek to get it, drive all the way back in. They're offered well, the, the roads office. would be washed out and there wouldn't be any electricity. <laughs> so, so, Mr. Chairman, in that situation, the, um, the election judge would offer that voter the ability to vote provisionally. What that does is it essentially buys that voter 24 hours um, to provide that information information to the clerk's office and show that they had legal grounds and that their ballot should be cast. So it's very important to make it very clear that information must be provided by the close of business the following day. And so once the voter gets their um, provisional ballot, it's designed in a way that it can't be uh, run through a machine. It's got to be clearly marked as provisional. They complete that, they'll seal it in an envelope with this uh, sticky seal on the front that just identifies, this was Malcolm Irvin's ballot, here's the district and precinct, so that the next day when I walk in, provide my driver's license, they can look at it and say, okay, this should be counted. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I do wanna say as a self-identified challenged voter, I appreciate that statute 2215-105 gives permission to voters like myself um, to vote. It specifically says that uh, challenged voters may vote. So thank you. Um, in all seriousness, when we're talking about challenging voters, it's those who, again, didn't bring their ID, the um, election judge challenged them, 
and it has to be rectified the following day. But the county canvassing board is actually the one who makes the decision as to whether or not that ballot gets counted. If they say, yes, it should be counted, they provided adequate documentation, we're convinced, then they adjourn to an executive session where they tabulate that, that ballot so that the voters, the way the voter voted is not identified to the public. So those three individuals on the canvassing board would know that information, but there's a criminal penalty attached if for some reason they were to tell somebody how Malcolm Urban ended up voting. Any questions about provisional ballots? If just one, if you had several provisional ballots that were then cleared the day after election day, could you do those all at the same time? Uh, run them together so you wouldn't have the anonymity problem? And Mr. Chairman, that is what we would do. We would process all of them at the same time. We'd go into an executive session, tabulate each of those. Um, where it becomes a little bit problematic is if you had a single provisional ballot. And it ID IDs. They, the canvassing board chose to, uh, that that ballot should be counted. So the public would have to know a couple of things. They would have to know, and I shouldn't probably give the inside track, but um, what they would need to know is what were the unofficial results on Tuesday evening? Who was the provisional voter? What were the final results that the canvassing board certified? And then you would identify, unfortunately, how that single voter voted. And so there is... Um, some issue with provisional ballots if it's in a limited scope. And like I said, only one gets counted. There would be a way. But we try everything we can to protect that, that voter's anonymity by going into an executive session and not airing that to the general public. Questions? Uh, Senator Barr. Like upon a previous question, you know, there's a question about whether you turn anybody away at the ballot box because of the voter ID. Um, seems like you would have a pretty or relatively solid metric with the number of provisional ballots to gauge where that occurred at all. I'm just wondering what your perspective is. Was there an increase in provisional ballots um, this election as opposed to previous elections? Mr. Irwin. Mr. Chairman, Senator Bonner, we don't have the information in front of us. We can follow up and we'll get the exact number of provisional ballots and compared to years past. Anecdotally, we prepared for that, that we would have an increase and we did not see that increase. And so um, we were pleasantly surprised. We had a vigorous uh, campaign working with the Secretary of State's office and our offices to inform the public. And, and there were individuals who came to the polls who did not have ID and in some cases left upset and didn't return. Some did return. But those aren't tracked. You know, there's nowhere that we're tracking that this person showed up and didn't have an ID unless they opted for a provisional ballot. Okay. Anybody else? Thank you. Back to you. Anything? But to talk about county canvassing would be Maureen Murphy. Okay. Go ahead. Mr. Chair, Maureen Murphy, Teton County Clerk. Could I ask you one small favor? Yeah. It's just between you and I. I really like chairman over chair, if that's okay. Mr. Chairman, yes. Thank you. Sorry about I'm that. I'm so old school. My apologies. Yeah, thank you very much. Absolutely. I appreciate it. Um, I am here to discuss the county canvas and the county canvassing board. Uh, as you may know, all of the results that are posted from the night of the election through before the board, cam the county canvas board meets. Um, are unofficial. So the county canvas board is made up of the county clerk and two electors of different um, political parties. They're appointed by the county clerk. Um, in my case, I contact the parties and they usually will send a, a representative. Um, and all of the canvassing board members shall take an oath of office. And so I am going to read the oath of office because I think it's pretty important for what these people are mm -hmm. um, pledging to. I do solemnly swear that I will impartially and to the best of my knowledge and ability perform the duties of my office. I will studiously endeavor to prevent all frauds, deceit, and abuse in the application of the election laws of this state. So prior to the county canvas, uh, the clerk and the clerk staff, um, they shall, they examine all the poll books, the tally sheets, um, cert cert precinct certifications, oath of, oath of office, um, summarize the votes cast in each precinct um, for every candidate appearing on the ballot, uh, appearing on the ballot, and the total votes cast for write-ins um, and upon each ballot proposition. 
um, in our office, we, we pretty much put all of the election materials that the county canvas and board can see out on tables throughout our, our um, early voting room. And so the canvas board can go through and look at all the documents and see if they have any questions, things like that. Um, on the day of the canvas, it has to be done by the Friday following, the first Friday following the election. Um, the ca canvas board performs and, or reviews a reconciliation of the ballots by precinct. They can compare the tapes that come out of the machines to what um, our unofficial results have been. Um, they review, and as Clerk Irwin said, they review and determine the eligibility of the provisional voters, and they can go into executive session um, in that when necessary to protect the confidenti confidentiality of provisional ballots. Uh, they count and tabulate the votes on those ballots um, and determine if they should be counted into the official results. Uh, they review and certify successful write-in candidates. And then um, they ensure that an abstract is created and contains all of the information that the, statu the statutes require. And then all, all the county canvas board members sign that document. Uh, some counties do participate in the post-election audit at the same time as the county canvas. Um, and then that gets sent to the Secretary of State's office where the state canvas board uh, must meet by the following Wednesday of the next week. And that is all I have. Um, do you have any questions? Questions? Thank you. Mm -hmm. How are we doing? Mr. Chairman, to put it in track terms, if this was the 1600 meter run, you're on the 100 meter stretch. So okay. I promise you can see the finish line. And, um, and so it's coming. To talk about ballot secrecy and poll watchers, it's Carrie Long. What, one second, Senator Scott. Okay, after this, keep going. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. To talk about ballot secrecy and poll watchers, it's Carrie Long, Sublette County Clerk. Chairman? Welcome. Thank you. My part is really short. <laughs> Um, I'm going to talk just briefly uh, to reiterate on voters uh, guaranteed absolute privacy. <clears throat> the Wyoming Constitution, Article 611 states, all voters shall be guaranteed absolute privacy in the preparation of their ballots, and the secrecy of the ballot should be made compulsory. Some might say a voter cannot be identified by their ballot cast because there's no name or signature on the ballot. But as Clerk Fries mentioned earlier, um, some splits in some counties are small enough to isolate a handful of voters. Also it can be especially problematic in a primary election where Democratic numbers are much lower than Republican. And in the case of write-in candidates, individual handwriting can be recognized, especially in a small community. So the election system is also designed to be open and transparent. Wyoming Statute 22.2.113, unless otherwise specifically stated in this election code, all election records of the county clerk are public. Name, gender, address, and party affiliation are publicly available information. However, records containing personal identif identifiable information such as social security numbers or portions of social security numbers, driver's license numbers, telephone numbers, tribal ID numbers, and email addresses are confidential. This is like a bad dream for this committee because we, we spent a whole day arguing about this language. Of I know. <laughs> so keep going. So essentially, some records are not available to the public, such as voter registration forms, ballots, or ballot images. So. Any questions about that? Thank you. Is this where you had your question, Senator Scott, or? Where a general question is in order. Mr. Irwin, not quite? Mr. Chairman. 50 yard line. If you could, if we could wait until the, <laughs> Got finish it. the third portion, then. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, Mr. Co-Chairman has some questions. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Co-Chairman. So on the, on the question of secrecy, and you noted on your slide I, that it's especially problematic in, um, for hand, or handwriting can be recognized, especially in small towns and precincts. It seems to me, you know, this isn't a problem that, that I, I see in my local 
um, district or county. And that's because we exclusively use electronic voting machines. It seems like if every county used an electronic voting machine, the handwriting problem would go away. And Mr. Chairman, uh, Chairman Olson, you are correct that on those express vote ballot marking devices, when you choose to write in a candidate, there is no handwriting, obviously. And so that that does help the situation. Uh, you still have the concern of splits that are so small that it would identify a voter, especially in the um, in the primary election, when you have a an area, a split where you may have one or two Democrats who vote in that precinct, and then you end up knowing how those one or two uh, voted. Just a quick anecdote about splits, Mr. Chairman. In Platt County, we have a school district, fire, and cemetery district that all converge, and it leaves one house all by its lonesome. And so that house gets its own ballot style. And so if ballots or ballot images were public record, that person's vote is identified. And so that's that's why we thought it was important to put this in here to let you know that handwriting is one component, but you also have the component of, of the splits. And Mr. Chairman, I should say on, um, on Laramie County specifically, um, on election day, it's exclusively the ballot marking device, but you still have the traditional absentee ballots that are issued where folks do have the ability to write write in. So Mr. Co-Chairman, I guess my question would be how, I mean, how big of, we heard this during the session, the handwriting concern, how big of a concern is it really pretty minimal, isn't it? Um, Mr. Chairman, I, I'm not really sure how to quantify a response. We obviously have a concern, otherwise we wouldn't put it in this slide. But realistically, we see the, the bigger concern being small splits. That's where those uh, could be identified. Mr. Chair, we'll talk about poll watchers. Wyoming Statute 2215-109, the county chairman of each political party may certify poll watchers prior to the day of election to serve in each polling place. Not more than one poll watcher from each political party may serve simultaneously unless the chief judge determines that additional poll watchers from each political party may be accommodated in the polling place without disrupting the polling process. Poll watchers are authorized to observe voter turnout and registration. They must belong to the political party they represent and be a registered elector residing in the county, and they are not allowed to challenge voters. By Secretary of State rules, they are not allowed to sit at the same table as election judges, and they shall wear appropriate identification as determined by the county clerk. I would like to just mention um, since the voter ID law came into effect, the Clerks Association got information after the primary that uh, voters, instead of stating their name at the election table, were handing the election judge their driver's license, and the poll watchers would not were not able to hear who the voter was. So we rectified that during the for the general and um, made sure the election judges knew. Even though the person handed them the ID, they still had to state their name for the poll watcher. So, <clears throat> also, Wyoming statute 2214102 states after all votes are cast and the polls are officially de declared closed, only election judges shall be permitted in a polling place. Essentially, saying the poll watchers have done their job and they're not allowed after the polls close. So, any questions about poll watchers? A um, couple of questions, maybe. Um, in other states, there have been issues of poll watchers uh, interacting with voters. And there's at least a couple of complaints in Wyoming about this that I've become aware of. And uh, some states prohibit poll watchers from being within a certain distance of a voter. Some prohibit them from talking to a voter or asking. So where are we on that? And, and uh, that's the first part of my question. You want to answer that? <laughs> Mr. Chairman, the, both parties conducted training for their poll watchers and were very clear in their training that um, poll watchers were not 
to challenge voters. Um, and, and sometimes that's difficult in a small town where they know you, they start chit-chatting. But what was really helpful was when we were made aware of those situations early. Um, unfortunately, sometimes those complaints are given to us on the back end when we're not able to fix it um, in the process of election day. So what was really helpful was when we got those complaints in real time so that we could address them on site and, and put an end to it that day. So I, Mr. Chairman, I wouldn't say that issue was per pervasive, but present um, from time to time. I think uh, Representative Newsom and I have learned that other states um, handle this differently. They have more specific rules about how close a poll watcher can be to a voter or to a process and actually uh, forbid the poll watcher to talk to him. So I, I don't know. We're going we're gonna to hear one complaint uh, in the public comment section today. The second issue is the tabulation process that occurs afterwards. And the poll watchers are sent away. And, and, and then uh, that part, I'm, I'm wondering, is it, I, I don't know quite how to say this, but it, it seems to me that there might be useful to have observers from outside in that process if they're not interfering with that process. And then that might be a legitimate position. And so, but the philosophy is candidates are out, everybody's out. It's just the election judges that, that do that work after the polls close. It seems to me, I can make an argument that that's a time when you ought to be able to have observers that are not interfering with the people to, to watch that situation. So help me with that. Why, why do we do it this way versus uh, another way? And is it the same for all states or how does that go? Well, Mr. Chairman, speaking to Wyoming specifically, the historical role of the poll watcher was and it specifically says in 2215-109 that they are there to observe voter turnout and registration. The historical intent of the poll watcher was at the general election, if the a lot of Republicans were checking in at the poll book, the Democratic poll watcher would rally the troops. We got to get folks right. out and about. That was the intent. That ain't going to happen watcher. anymore. <laughs> and so, Mr. Chairman, that I think the the use of poll watchers has shifted from what that statute initially authorized them to do. And if that were to change, that would be a policy discussion. Um, we would stay out of that administratively. Once the polls close, it is a hectic time where, I mean, the polls close at seven and inevitably at 7.05, we get a phone call. When are you putting results online? Well, we're still trying to get people out of the building at 7.05. And so it's just a hectic time. So the the fewer feet to step on, the better. That certainly helps. But Mr. Chairman, in terms of policy, whether they should or should not be in the polling place after the polls close, I think that would be as squarely in your court. Just saying from our point of view, it is easier the fewer people we have after the polls close, just so there's, it's not quite as hectic. And then, and then last year, we heard of an incident where the polls closed, but the people in line were still allowed to vote as is custom and requirement. But the poll watchers were escorted out in this one circumstance. And it is a, it's, it's, it was due to a reading of the catch title under the law part. If you remember, we had this discussion, everybody. Has that been remedied? Is it clear that we agree that when there are people in line that haven't voted yet, the poll watchers can remain? We, we good on that? Yes. And also just to point out, observers, not poll watchers, but observers are allowed during the uh, absentee, the early absentee process. Right. Thank you. Senator Scott, can we get to your question? Ms. Uh, comment and, and, uh, and a question. Uh, comment. I've been dealing with county clerks on election issues ever since I was chairman of this, this committee. That was more than 30 years ago. Actually, they've been dealing with you, Senator <laughs> Well, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but what I want to say is that it's been my observation that one of the reasons, one of the principal reasons we have such pure elections here in Wyoming, and I think we do, is 
that the county clerks, without exception, recent history, county clerks have been absolutely dedicated to preserving the purity of election. And Mr. Chairman, I want to publicly commend the county clerks for the excellent job they've done and hope they continue that dedication because you can do all the things in the law and, the, and on paper that you ought to do, and it's still people. And the, the people have to be dedicated, and county clerks have been, to the purity of elections. And I, I very much want to count, compliment all our county clerks on that. It's, it's been, in recent history, a universal in the state. And it's a great strength. Now, Mr. Chairman, my question is the thing I see in the coming election that I think is going to cause trouble is with the bill we passed on the registration and the change of registration. I think people are probably going to understand that you can't switch from Republican to Democrat or Democrat to Republican. Well, I think the trouble is going to come is that people who are unaffiliated are going to think that they can change to a party for the primary and going to be surprised when told that unaffiliated is party designation. And they won't believe that. And we'll, we'll be, I think we're going to have quite a bunch of angry voters. And Mr. Chairman, frankly, it's one of the reasons I voted against that bill. But my question for the county clerks is, have you developed yet any plans for educating the public on that issue so they're warned ahead of time, ahead of the, the uh, deadline that they aren't going to be allowed to switch from unaffiliated to a party? Because I think that's where we're going to get angry voters. Who's going to address that? Well, Mr. Chairman, first, thank you, Senator Scott, for the the compliment and the confidence you have on behalf of 23 county clerks, we appreciate that very much. And it's been a privilege working with you um, and all of you. Um, your question about um, campaign to inform voters about the, the deadline, as an association, we've worked diligently to have a uniform message across the board on a number of subjects. And our group will undoubtedly do that. We actually meet in Sheridan in June. Um, and I'm sure that that will be one of our discussions we have. If, if you think this was dense, boy, sit in that room. When you, you have 23 county clerks and their staff and they're trying to develop a uniform message on how you let unaffiliated voters know that, Senator Scott, it's an in-depth discussion down to the comma, the period, the apostrophe. Very good. So our think, last subject, Mr. Okay, Chairman, last subject. You are at the finish line. Deborah Lee, Laramie County Clerk, will talk about purging. So the purge of the voter list is mandated in Wyoming Statute 22-113E. County clerks shall purge and update the voter registration information on the voter registration system not later than the 15th day of February each year and shall notify the Secretary of State upon completion. The purge is part of the list maintenance that we regularly perform on our voter rolls. Just as we maintain our cars and our furnaces, we do frequent maintenance on WyoReg. Why? Well, obviously to ensure the integrity of elections so that only those persons who are eligible to vote are on the voter list and to improve the efficiency of elections. Obviously, if there's more voters on the registry, we need to allocate more resources in terms of personnel and materials. So list maintenance is important for us, it's important for voters, and it's important for campaigns. Routinely and frequently, as I mentioned, we perform list maintenance. As Mr. Odie mentioned, WyoReg interfaces with YDOT, with the Social Security Administration, with the Department of Health, with the Division of Criminal Investigation and the Board of Parole. 
We also receive notifications from other jurisdictions about voters who have moved from our jurisdictions. Our system also identifies potential duplicate registrations once a record is created. The action referred to as the purge is the removal of those who fail to vote in the last general election. Each February following a general election, clerks cancel hundreds, if not thousands of registration records. Wyoming has the most robust and some would even say aggressive list maintenance in the nation. Most states wait four years or more before removing the names of voters who do not vote. So how is Wyoming different? Well, the reason is because we are one of six states that are exempt from the National Voter Registration Act or the Motor Voter Law. Colorado, for example, has to wait at least two election cycles before names of inactive voters are removed from their system. How do we purge? Well, when we purge, we mail notices to all voters at their address on the registry list, stating the reason their registration will be canceled. The notice states that cancellation will occur within 20 days unless the voter requests that his or her name remain on the list. High turnout in the 2020 presidential election and low turnout in the 2022 midterm election meant that we purged a lot of voters statewide. More than 86,000 registration records were canceled. That's over 28% of the voter list. Laramie County, we, we was higher, we actually purged 32%. These voters, if they are still in our counties and wish to vote in the next election, will have to re-register. And you, you've heard all about how all that process works. So I wanna mention in conclusion that the voter registration system is one of the very few government databases that does not require citizens to inform us when they move. We have to chase the voters. They don't, it's not the other way around. Voters update other information, even newspaper subscriptions or magazine subscriptions, before they update their address with the county clerk. Thank you. Uh, Senator Lamb. No. Thank you very much. Uh, great comments and very informative. So if you had the ideal solution to what you just said, would it involve a requirement that a voter who moves contacts your office? That would Is be that... ideal, but very, Mr. Chairman, sorry. Uh, that would be ideal, but very difficult to enforce. Um, one way that would make it easier would be if we had online registration. And that's a heavy lift. Thank you. Anybody else? So are you guys done? So uh, you've done, that was a great morning, a lot longer than I thought it was gonna be. So we have this issue, we have public comments uh, scheduled right now or after the clerks, okay? And then we have the Secretary of State's office to talk to us about elections and we have public comment again. And I would like to put, uh, put forward with an idea that, um, and I'm people online please, that maybe we combine the two public comments to try to, uh, just hear from the Secretary of State on election issues. And then we have public comment on all election issues. One, one round of public comment. Then we take lunch and we come back and hear about the rest of the Secretary of State's office operation. Is that acceptable? Does anybody feel slighted by that? And I realize you folks online have been waiting very patiently, but it seems like it's a way to speed this up a lot, little bit and we are kind of behind due to some great work. So absent objection, I think that's what I'd like to do. Is that is that okay with you, Mr. Secretary? We hear from you on election issues, and then we'll have public comment on both. Acceptable? Okay. Welcome and come on board. Thank you very much to the clerks. Thank Again. you. So anybody that's waiting for public comment, we're going to have general election public comment uh, after the uh, Secretary of State speaks about elections. And I do want to point out, we have our new Arapaho tribal liaison who's out of the governor's office, Anita Roman.
Would you stand, Anita? She's just appointed to the tribal, Arapaho tribal relations, and she's in the governor's office. And I see County Commissioner Jones there, and I have another County Commissioner. Who are, you're a County Commissioner, ma'am? Welcome, very much welcome. Mr. Secretary, welcome. Good to see you. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. First wanna say, really appreciate the County Clerk's presentation and all their work and look forward to continuing to work with them on election administration. Didn't wanna ask you, uh, Mr. Chairman, originally we were going to roll our elections presentations into the uh, Secretary of State's office updates. I guess you're saying you wanna break that out. I, I do think this is gonna take about 40 minutes, maybe 30 to 40, depending on questions. Um, do you want us to move forward in that way? And try to truncate it as much as possible. We have a presentation, about eight slides. Uh, we have a couple introductions and then implementation updates on, on elections. I guess we could roll those out and do the slides, which are sort of uh, some of the statutory things we'd like to do and, and combine that with uh, introductions regarding our uh, new election staff. But anyway, just well, wanted I to get a little I, guidance from you. I think I could maybe truncate this down about 25 to 30, but is that... Um, is that acceptable to the committee? I mean, we still have to have public comment because we don't want to force people to wait till after lunch for public comment. So we might be getting to lunch by like one. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, the other option is we could just do an introduction of the chain of our, our our staff members and then roll the election updates after lunch. I think the introductions would take about 15, 10 minutes. The only thing I'm worried about is that the public comment piece on elections. So, yeah. And uh, uh, committee, looking for guidance, Mr. Co-Chairman. Hey, Mr. Co-Chairman, I think that you aim for it. It sounds like if I'm hearing the Secretary of State right, he can truncate his elections presentation into 25 minutes. And if we aim for a 1230 stop time, that still gives us a good 10, 15 minutes of public comment. And then we'll take the rest of your updates when we get back. Yeah. Okay. Then we'll do that if that's okay. Okay. Thank you. And you can introduce staff whenever you want. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The first thing I'd like to do is provide an update on our elections division uh, before we dig into our office's administration and implementation of statutory changes following the 2023 general session. I want to take the time to introduce our election staff. First, we have Dusty Shryak, who joined our team in March as the election records and research analyst. He worked at the Department of Corrections prior to this, having worked at the Honor Farm, Honor Farm here in Fremont County. Dusty has been instrumental in fulfilling voter registry list requests and has been working with our assistant director, Paul Rains, with day-to-day -day operations of the election division. Dusty has been working closely with our council, Joe Rubino, and technology division director on the implementation of House Bill 5, which interacts with our voter registry list and voter history file requests. I also want to introduce our elections director, CJ Young. CJ will be joining our office on June 12th and was kind enough to take a day and come up here. Come on up, CJ. A couple things about CJ. Uh, CJ grew up in Carbon County. Uh, he served the state of Wyoming for the past eight years, most recently as the policy planning manager for the Wyoming Department of Corrections, so has a lot of experience uh, in, in the policy realm, and also attended the University of Wyoming, earning his law degree and master's in public administration in 2014. So, wow. CJ, do you want to say anything? Yeah, just briefly. Well, Mr. Chairman, um, CJ Young here, uh, just very excited for this opportunity to be working for the secretary and working with the people of Wyoming. Uh, it was great to see this presentation this morning. I look forward to getting to meet all of the different clerks and getting to know you all better. So it's uh, just a really exciting opportunity and I can't wait to get started. And I'll be available for any questions if folks have them down the road, whatever I can do to help you out. We're very glad to have you. So we are now going to move into our updates on statutory implementation. First on House Bill 5. So I'm going to turn it over to our counsel, Joe Rubino, our policy director, to talk a little bit about the work he's been doing with Mr. Shryak. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome. Joe Rubino, I'm the general counsel, chief policy officer with the Secretary of State. 
Um, wanted to provide a brief update on House Bill 5, that was House Enrolled Act 30, which has an effective date of uh, July 1st, 2023. I, I know, Mr. Chairman, I'll be brief. Uh, I don't want to bring up too much of the PTSD from, from all that that you mentioned earlier, but um, as you know, the House Bill 5 tweaked the language in Wyoming statute 22 to 113, specifically subsection D among other sections. But I'll briefly read what was originally uh, under subsection D, unless otherwise specifically stated in this election code, all election records of the county clerk are public. The availability and dissemination of such records shall be in accordance with the Wyoming Public Records Act. The election records containing social security numbers portions of social security numbers, driver's license numbers, birth dates, telephone numbers, tribal identification card numbers, email addresses, and other personally identifiable information other than names, gender, addresses, and party affiliations are not public records and shall be kept confidential. When necessary, members of the county or state canvassing boards may access confidential information for purposes of this code, but shall maintain its confidentiality. As you know, um, also, we added uh, to our voter registry list statutes the following information that is not personally identifiable information that's not subject to disclosure. This included the unique identifying number generated by the state, commonly referred to as the voter ID number, the absentee ballot status, and the registration date. And um, we also call that the effective registration date. Wanted to provide a brief update on that. As you know, our office and the county clerks, we provide a number of files. The voter registry list um, file is essentially a snapshot in time of the current list of registered voters. So when the county clerks uh, presented that um, the YO reg portion of their presentation, that's that snapshot. When you request that data for a reasonable fee that's um, set, um, then you get the uh, existing snapshot. But it also, that statute affects what is publicly available information or personally identifiable information that's not subject to disclosure for other files that we release. Those are the voter history files and the absentee history files. As uh, you may remember, we export those files from our YO-REG system for the each primary and general election. So for the primary election, we export those files on October 1st, following the uh, primary election. And then for the general election voter history files and absentee history files, we export that data from our YO-REG system on uh, January 1st, following the general election. The addition of the voter ID number, the absentee ballot status, and the effective registration date, that affected both of those uh, records that were uh, the information, the fields that were subject to disclosure. So for each um, voter, or really the more appropriate way to look at it is for each ballot associated with um, each individual voter for the voter history files and the absentee history files, you had to um, attach the uh, voter ID number, the absentee ballot status, and the registration date. That was a, a, a very simple fix for our YO-REG system proactively moving forward, um, where we uh, put that into our system. And when we get a request under state statute for a voter registry list, we add that, um, th those fields of information. So you'll get that. Where that was a little bit um, uh, more of a lift, and I worked with uh, Dusty Schrack in our elections division, were the voter history and absentee history files, because those uh, retroactive files did not contain that information that was released to the public. Now, we did have master files um, that were exported that did contain those fields. And, and so we worked closely, and now we have, to the best of our technological ability, dating back to 2008, that was when we uh, started collecting those uh, voter uh, history files and the absentee history files, we have a streamlined process to get uh, people the, that submit public records requests for those history files and absentee history files, the complete set that's in conformance now with uh, House Bill 5. So I wanted to provide a little bit of, of an update on that. I can also provide now a little bit of an update on Senate File 40. 
Mr. Chairman, Mr. We, do, we do want to provide a little bit of an update on Senate file for you. I know that's near and dear to uh, the co-chairman's heart. Uh, there are some implementation pieces in terms of getting this on our, our website. We're working through those and making sure those filings can happen. And a lot of, a lot of questions from the public about uh, how this is going to work. So we're, we're making this happen. So I wanted to turn that over to Mr. Rubino. And maybe just for the people listening, what, what are we talking about? Yeah. Not everybody's do, working in numbers of Senate files. Yes, absolutely. So Senate file 40, also known as Senate Enrolled Act number 35, um, this amended the uh, filing of camp, the statute governing filing of campaign finance reports, specifically subsection G to Wyoming statute 2225-106. And uh, effective July 1, that will provide that candidates for federal office, campaign committees for candidates for federal office, and federal political action committees, and now I'll, I'll read the uh, amended language that was added after the 2023 session, that are making contributions or expenditures only to federal candidates or for federal issues shall not be required to file contribution and expenditure reports under this section if the candidate or the committee is required to comply with federal election law reporting requirements. So just to break that down a little bit, Mr. Chairman, and what that did is that now uh, federal campaign uh, committees, so campaign committees that are red, political action committees that are registered with the FEC, not originally with our office as Wyoming political action committees under Wyoming statute, those that get involved in uh, state races, so they aren't expenditures only to federal candidates. They uh, give to state candidates, um, statewide elected uh, candidates, or the like. They'll be required to file contribution and expenditure reports under 2225-106, so pursuant to the requirements set forth in A through F of that section, of that statute. Um, following the passage of Senate File 40, we, we did receive numerous correspondence from federal political action committees wanting regulatory certainty uh, about what would be required of them in the 2024 election. So would uh, submitting their FEC reports, for example, uh, suffice and, and comply with the requirements that we have? In working through those with our elections division in, in review of both federal requirements and Wyoming state reporting requirements for campaign finance, we've been able to narrow down these, these inquiries into sort of three solutions that we're moving forward with now. And, and the first one was a question, how will they be able to fulfill the reporting requirements? Well, for that, for that solution, the most practical way would be to integrate into our existing YCFA system, so our campaign finance system, the reporting requirements for political action committees. Uh, in doing so, we want to be cognizant of uh, catching or earmarking when federal political action committees uh, are registering their account. So it's an online account. If, if Everybody on the committee is familiar with that. Um, when you create your account with our office for a, a YCFIS account to fulfill those requirements, originally that module was called the PAC formation module. Uh, well, that's a little bit different um, than what the spirit and the intent of Senate File 40 had, which was not that you're requiring federal campaign committees to create a state committee, you're just requiring them to comport with the reporting requirements, just as any uh, state political action committee would do. They'll still have to create an account, but what we are working through right now with our technology division is creating the requirements um, for our vendor that we can uh, filter out federal uh, election, uh, FEC political action committees that are engaged in those and are creating an account specifically for those reporting requirements. So they won't go on to our roster for our Wyoming political action committees, but they will have an account created. And so we're tweaking some of the language on that module so that you as a 
federal political action committee won't be uh, triggered that you are creating a Wyoming political action committee. That will have other ramifications. Um, but what we'll, we'll be providing is an integration into our existing system and essentially a carve out so that uh, federal PACs can comply with the reporting requirements. That plays into the, the second system that we asked, which was, well, do we just need to create a Wyoming political action committee? Well, now when you check a box, uh, what, what we're proposing right now is when you uh, come to a certain field and you select that you are a federal political action committee, you'll be required before you move forward to check a box that you are just comporting with the requirements and you are not creating a Wyoming political action committee. That will bifurcate you from all of the Wyoming political action committees, so you will not show up on the roster of Wyoming political action committees. Finally, um, federal PACs had the question of how they'll fulfill the reporting requirements, and this goes back to, well, would they be able to just submit their FEC reports? As we all know, they're also required to report with the FEC. The disparity there is that there are different statutory deadlines for federal reporting requirements than ours. So if you're going to create uh, this scenario where they have to they have to uh, comply with 2225-106, which inherently includes the timing requirements of 2225-106 before the primary and general election, then you wouldn't be able to comply with that and still just facsimile your FEC reports and contributions and, and bring them in. And so that's that's what we're working forward with right now. I just wanted to provide a brief update uh, sort of on the, the implementation um, effects that, that that's having and, and how we're working through that. I think that was very well done. And I think the issue is, is if a federal uh, uh, PAC participates somehow in a Wyoming ballot issue or, or an election that the timing of their federal filings doesn't match. You know, it'd be great if the timing matched, we wouldn't even have to get them in, but it's, it doesn't necessarily match. So good work. At this time, one other bill, we just wanted to note really quick, House Bill 279, Representative Knapp's bill, which gets to this issue that the clerks talked about earlier, which is uh, an absentee ballot that was requested in person uh, that that would require a voter ID. The idea of the voter ID law was that all in-person balloting, all balloting with an in-person nexus will require a voter ID. And that was a little bit of a nuance that we didn't, didn't uh, quite address in the 2021 House Bill 75. We did with House Bill 279. And I think that's a very, very good addition to our election code. We'll talk about 103 a little bit in our presentation, uh, the crossover bill. Let's go ahead and pull up the presentation now. This is sort of our, one way to label it would be maybe uh, statutory interim topic requests, at least at, at meeting one. Okay. Uh, we have basically five requests. One of them is on the special districts, which we'll talk about later. Or it was on the agenda later. So I think we rolled that one out. Okay. Uh, let's go ahead to slide two. This is on the durational residency requirement, which uh, I think is a, going to be a pretty, is important and also a little bit of a heavy lift for the committee. So I think this is going to define a little bit, potentially the interim on the elections area. As you know, and was discussed earlier, Article 6, Section 2 of the Wyoming Constitution sets out a one-year residency requirement, which was later struck down by the Wyoming Supreme Court. I'm going to turn this over to our counsel, Mr. Rubino, to lay out a little bit more of the history there on the case law. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Mr. Rubino. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yeah, so as the secretary said, Article 6, Section 2 of the Wyoming Constitution, it provides uh, for a one-year residency requirement in the state and a 60-day residency requirement in the county. Um, it's a, a very long um, history, and I, the LSO memo gets into this uh, a little bit. I want to step back uh, a little bit in the historical context for the uh, resident, durational residency requirements for um, states across the nation. And it really dates back to um, uh, really the, the nation's founding. But in a lot of state constitutions, 
our Wyoming's constitution is not unique. In a lot of state constitutions, we had, um, I believe over 30 states had residency requirements in the state to, to vote over one year. Um, I, I believe a handful of states had uh, six months, Han a handful of other states had uh, over, over a year and a half uh, re durational residency requirement. Um, with the amendments to the Voting Rights Act of 1965, and then the subsequent U.S. Supreme Court cases that came down in the 1970s, uh, these constitutional, state constitutional residency requirements were uh, struck down, and states have since adopted shorter durational, durational residency requirements. The amendments to the Voting Rights Act of 1965 that was passed in 1970, it did a couple of things. And um, I'm happy to, to go through that. Uh, one of which it abolished the, uh, it prohibited states from implementing uh, durational residency requirements for president and vice president, uh, elections for president and vice president of the United States. It also, implemented uniform registration uh, requirements for states, states in addition to having durational residency requirements, six months, one year, even exceeding one year, they also had uh, registration requirements that were uh, equally as, as long. And so um, what it did is it provided for a, a more uniform set of registration requirements not to exceed 30 days. And then um, following the amendments to the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and 1970, there were a couple of Supreme Court cases in which um, the Voting Rights Act amendments were explicitly challenged and also uh, state residency requirements in turn were, were challenged as well. Oregon v. Mitchell in uh, the early 1970s, that is a, uh, a case in which it generally upheld the 1970 amendments to the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Um, however, I believe there were five concurrences. There was one main opinion, and it was, it's been called by judicial scholars sort of a, a patchwork of holdings. What came out of that was uh, Dunn v. Bloomstein, which was decided in 1972. That dealt with Tennessee's uh, voter registry, uh, sorry, durational registry, re durational residency requirement for voting in their state elections. That was challenged on equal protection grounds under the 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Um, what came out of that was uh, a holding, and I'll read part of it here, quote, 30 days, uh, let's see. In which they address the state interests of having durational residency requirements. And they uh, discussed that 30 days appears to be an ample period of time for uh, administration of elections and to prevent voter fraud for a statewide residency requirement. Following that, we have Del Giorno v. Huisman, in which uh, the Wyoming Supreme Court, on the heels of Dunn v. Bloomstein, discussed the uh, Wyoming's durational residency requirement under Article 6, Section 2 of the Wyoming Constitution. I'll read a little bit of that opinion under the Dunn analysis, and they pulled extensively from Dunn v. Bloomstein, quote, requirements in our state constitution and state laws for a durational residence of one year in the state and residence in excess of 30 days in the county as a precondition for voting are, under the state of the record before us, repugnant to the 14th Amendment of the United States Constitution as construed by the United States Supreme Court in Dunn v. Bloomstein. What that left open were shorter durational residency requirements in, I'll read part of that opinion. Uh, 
we hold that in light of our present constitutional and statutory provisions, election officials may require as a precondition for registering that a voter will have been a resident of the county for 30 days immediately preceding the primary or general election. And then further down after the quote section that I just read, a requirement that a voter be a resident of the precinct where he may offer to vote for at least 10 days is constitutional and shall stand. Since that time, the uh, Wyoming legislature has not passed any shorter durational residency requirements than the one year residency requirement for the state that was struck down in, Del Jorn in the Del Giorno case in 1972. The bottom line here is that 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 constitutional provision was struck down and in absence of action by the legislature, we, we, we think we need to have action on a durational residency requirement. I would ask the committee at least to consider this. We believe a 30 day uh, residency requirement uh, for state races and, and would, would pass federal and, and state muster. Um, and we can talk, continue to talk about these patchwork of cases. It's a little bit complex. Uh, what happened there in the 60s and 70s. I mean, you, you look back in time, I mean, I was just reading the, one of the law review articles on this. I mean, a couple of days ago, you had 28 states with year-long residency requirements, 14 uh, with six months, and then, and then two that actually had two years, and then it kind of all, all fell apart over, over uh, three or four years. And uh, we do believe that action is needed. Now, states have taken action since the 70s when these changes happened. Colorado, Idaho, Illinois, Indiana, Kentucky, Mississippi, Montana, Nevada, New Jersey, New York, North Carolina, North Dakota, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Utah, Washington, Wisconsin, all have durational residency requirements, uh, different ranges. So that, that's a little bit the history on that. This is where we think it would go. Uh, in, in statute would be our suggestion for it to go here. Go ahead to the next slide. The, the next uh, ask that we have is a little bit uh, of a, a little bit less of a lift here. Hold on, Mr. Secretary. Yes. Senator Scott. Mr. Chairman, uh, I'm confused on the interplay here between the court cases and the Voting Rights Act. Mm -hmm. uh, if we have a short durational requirement, would it, can it apply to presidential and vice presidential votes or would those have to be treated separately with no requirement? Well, Mr. Mr. Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll turn this over to council in a minute. This is a complex question and one that I think we will need to delve into at the second meeting a little bit. But Marston v. Lewis was a case that upheld a 50-day residency requirement in Arizona. No states bifurcate the two ballots. And there are many states that have a 30-day residency, durational residency requirement, okay? And, and it's actually over a majority. And you have North Dakota, which has same-day registration and a durational residency requirement, which would be the box that we would fit into. So we, we believe that it would pass the, the muster. I'll turn this over to council for a little bit more. Uh, Representative Yen is going to follow up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and maybe Council or, or the Secretary can help answer this. Um, so I guess I'm confused on why we're doing this other than other states have done it. What is the compelling interest of the state to impose one when we've had all along no requirement and it seems to be working just fine? Is there something not working by having no duration of residency requirement? Mr. Secretary, or you can but, yield to Council. You, you know, want. Mr. Chairman, I think when I asked the clerks a, a question that I think, when I asked them if someone showed up at a hotel and asked for a ballot, asked to register, and I asked them, is that an illegal action? And the clerk's response back, uh, you know, we can get them up here, is it's not clear. That's scary to me. Um, and I, I think a 30-day requirement, it passes the, the strict scrutiny test. Uh, the, the state has a, a clear compelling interest to make sure that, that those who are casting ballots are indeed Wyoming residents. And to have a, a relatively 
you know, moderate residency durational requirement. We're not talking back to the year long or two years that back in the late 1890s when, when states were passing their constitutional requirements, we're talking a 30 day requirement um, that protects those that are residents of the state and are casting ballots and provides uh, that clarity as to who can vote and, and, and in what situations they can register. Follow up. Mr. Secretary, is this a problem that you've actually witnessed or encountered, or is it just a hypothetical? Mr. Secretary. Well, Mr. Chairman, I, I, I don't think it's a hypothetical. I mean, you know, when, when we engage with the clerks on it and uh, they agree that this needs to be shored up, um, I, I think that's a real situation. Go on. Sure, Mr. Chairman. I mean, the, the only thing I would say then is I would love to hear the clerks say that they agree that it's a situation that they would like to sure. I, I think they've been discussing it. Uh, Senator Landon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, appreciate your report here. You provided the durational residency statutory clarification page uh, 221102. Uh, have you have you implemented changes that you would recommend there, or is this simply the statute as it exists today? I haven't looked that up, um, it, and it would be up to the committee to decide how to how to insert the thirty day requirement. Or can you clarify that for me? I yeah. feel like I'm missing something here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Go this ahead. slide lays out the current statute. And this is where, in our opinion, we didn't want to be too prescriptive. We're happy to work with council if there is a bill draft motion, wanted to uh, you know, have that legislative prerogative here. Uh, we did kick around a few, a few drafts the way we would, we would have it, but uh, this is where we would put it. That's, that's, that's what we were trying to illustrate uh, with this slide. And we're so, happy to work with LSO council on, on some of the, the approaches that we've that we've uh, kicked around you, on. Secretary. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and presumably it'd go in the list under 223102, under part A, it'd be another Romanet there, presumably. Who's next? Uh, Representative Newsom. Mr. Chairman, um, so what would, what would the documentation look like? So if I moved to Wyoming, got a job, spent 30 days in a hotel because I couldn't find a place to live, um, what documentation would I have to bring to be able to register to vote to say, I have been here for 30 days. I don't yet have a utility bill because I have not yet procured a place to live. I don't yet have documentation. So what documentation would one need to prove that they had been here for 30 days? Anybody want to take a stab at that? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, the, the registration process would remain identical. Um, so, you know, you would, you would have that registration process, which was just laid out in that, in that presentation. Uh, did you want to follow up, Representative Newsom? And just to throw in, it seems to me that there's an issue of whether we want them to be here 30 days to register or whether we want them to be here 30 days to vote. And you can register in advance of voting. And so there's that issue that probably ought to be cleared up. It's just like we had candidates that ran for office that when they filed for office, they weren't qualified to file for office because they hadn't been here long enough. But when the election occurred, they were qualified. I, I think that's a nuance on this too. That is exactly the crux of my confusion or, or question. Okay. Is how, how does- Is your mic on? It is. I'm okay, sorry. I'm sorry. Um, is how, how does a potential voter prove that they have been here for 30 days? What documentation do they need to bring? Because I think that would be key to this statute is how, how does one prove that? Is it as simple as an affidavit? Is it as complex as some a lease agreement or a mortgage or, or something else that proves that they've been there? Any thoughts? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, so and again, you'd have that registration process, which uh, is laid out and was in that presentation. So all those things that you, you need to present to register on top of that, you'd have that att attestation that, which is basically an affidavit that you had, that you had been there 
for the 30 days and could update that in the statute, make that conforming amendment. And, and certainly, Mr. Secretary, you yourself said, this is not that easy. We have to think about this and spend a little bit of time yes. with the nuances at the next meeting. So more conceptual there's right a now. Lot. Yeah, we're more conceptual. Yeah, Representative Bob. Mr. Chairman, and, and just to say, um, I'm very glad to hear this here today because, um, Mr. Secretary, when there was a meeting in Riverton and um, there was different people there, one of the questions was, although we have one of the best election systems in the country, what could we do to make it better? And that one thing was residency requirements. And I remember that specifically from the clerk. So um, it's good that we're handling it and uh, getting on board with that and moving forward. So thank you. Thank you, Representative. Thank you, Mr. Back Chairman. To your, and back to you thank guys. you, Representative Ottman. And, and yeah, we're all about constant improvement. And, and uh, I think that this is, this is a little bit of a hole. And uh, we've had conversations with the clerks. Don't want to speak for them, want to be careful. But we have had conversations with them and uh, talked to them the fact we were going to be bringing this to the first meeting. And, um, so anyway, let's go ahead to the next slide, move into our next topic. Uh, this one's a little bit of a less of a lift. This was actually a bill that was brought in in the last session that didn't quite go through the process, I think partially because it's a pretty small issue, but it did come about last November, uh, and it's uh, something we want to clear up. There's a little bit of a conflict in statute between 22-22-102, which states that a board of trustees term shall run for four years beginning at 12 noon on the first day in December following the election, and then 21 3 106 which provides that the trustees of each school district shall within 10 days after receiving notification of their election or appointment and before assuming the duties of their offices appear some person qualified to administer oaths and take an oath for the faithful performance of their duties as required by law. Now, there's probably, you, you could create a legal explanation on how these don't conflict because one specifically deals with an oath and one specifically deals with the start of a term. However, we think the better approach is just to fix it uh, and can you move to the next slide? And this would be the fix that the trustees of each school district shall honor before the first day of December after receiving notification of their election or within 10 days after receiving notification of their appointment and before assuming the duties of their offices appear to administer the oath. Dot, 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 dot. We think that the provenance of this may have been appointments versus elections because we think the second statute may have dealt with. Uh, and I, I think in the LSO approach on this, when they drafted the original bill, that that they came to a similar conclusion. So I think this just shores up that conflict a little bit and provides clarity to our uh, school board, uh, winners of our school board elections as to when their offices start and when they should take the oath. Let's go ahead to the next. So, uh, sounds good so far, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Keep going. Let's go ahead to the next one. This is our uh, third uh, issue that we were hoping. Uh, this has been in a number of bills over the last three years uh, and has, has not yet hit the floor, but we think it is something that we would like the committee to consider taking up, uh, which is banning the private funding of elections. This came out of the 2020 election where the Center for Tech and Civic Life and the Center for Election Innovation and Research announced commitment of $300 million to state and local election administers, and this was supposed to be for PPE and things like that attached to COVID and sanitizer, things like that. And it ended up being used a lot for uh, solicitation purposes, for harvesting purposes. And uh, it's commonly known as Zuck Bucks. Uh, and this private funding really creates high risk of undue influence over administration of elections. Go ahead to the next slide. 24 states have passed uh, bans that will regulate the use of private funding for the administration of elections. It was introduced as House Bill 224, the prohibition on private funds for conducting elections, which was, excuse me, it was not considered for introduction, it was numbered, uh, it was not considered for introduction. So that would be our third uh, request of the committee to consider for possible bill drafts. The fourth one is on House Bill 103, uh, which was the crossover bill. At the end of that process, there was con concerns raised by uh, the attorney general uh, about how it applies to new electors 
after the lockout period starts. So somebody that turns 18 or somebody that say moves into the state uh, and is a resident, granted at this point, not a durational resident, but a resident, which could be just one moment in time. Uh, and we do believe the statute is operable. We had a lot of back and forth on that. Uh, we're very thankful for the governor allowing that bill to become law. Uh, but we do, we're always for improvements. So uh, we think to have a simple bill that gets uh, qualified in the proper spots before elector as opposed to just elector, and then we can have a big debate on, because uh, there is debates on how many times it should be qualified elector versus elector, uh, but we can go ahead. I, I think we should go ahead and address that just to clear up any any confusion. So uh, that that would be one other ask we consider for the committee. And Mr. Secretary, uh, Senator Landon. Yes. yes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I appreciate, Mr. Secretary, you coming around to my way of thinking. <laughs> that was exactly my amendment on the Senate floor, and it passed. It was then uh, upended. Um, so, you know, I, I, I appreciate you uh, coming to us with that, because I do think that clarification would, would be healthy, and it would be good for the statute. Um, I, I kind of share the concerns that Senator Scott had, which, uh, you know, our fear was if we were going to catch somebody and, and put them in a situation where they could register. So appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Senator, you know, senators have to be very patient, but fortunately, they're very old, so they can be very patient. Well, Mr. Chairman, we, we believe the statute is operable, but, but we're all for improvement, and we're all Sounds for that. Good. We're Sounds all for that. Council, did you want to say anything on that? I'm not sure. Okay. Those were our four outside of the special districts, which was a clear uh, okay. separate item on the agenda. So I think it's appropriate for us to do that later. Okay, hey, let's let's see if there's questions and then let's open it up to public yeah. comment. And uh, very well received and we'll take up uh, discussion of your bill draft proposals. So, um, but we'll do that after lunch. But yes, uh, mm -hmm. Representative Newsom. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a question on the um, private funding of elections. Did Wyoming get any of that three hundred million that the um, Center for Tech and Civic Life had announced they were committing? Did we take any of those funds in Does Wyoming? Anybody know the answer to that, uh, Mr. Chairman? Not that I'm aware of, but you know, it's like anything—you get ahead of issues that that could happen in the future, and so that's what we're trying to do: get ahead of this. There's no uh, admission that this has occurred. Uh, we're not saying it necessarily 100% has not occurred, but not to my knowledge. And, and the way I'd like to position this is that it's getting ahead of a future issue, um, potential issue. Thank you, Ms. Secretary. Thank you. With everybody, let's go to public comment, if we could. And uh, Ms. Talbot? Oh, I'm certainly, let's go. Uh, Representative Harrelson, I'm very sorry. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sorry, guys. I'm, I know I'm stuck kind of in this virtual world. Uh, just addressing the qualified electorate electorate conversation that's something that as we had that conversation on 103 we realized that that it was kind of clunky in our statutes and so uh sorry i would have weighed in a little while back but i think it's definitely something we need to look at as as a cleanup just to make sure that uh we don't we don't inadvertently create a problem but i i think uh if we were to take a 30,000 foot view on it, we have a problem there that needs to be addressed. And it has actually nothing probably even to do really with the scope of 103 and, and crossover voting. It just naturally, it's not properly defined in that statute. Thank you, Representative. Thank you very much. Anything else? All right, we're gonna open up to public comment in the room first, and then we'll go to our online uh, presenter. So Ms. Simmons, you come on up and uh, Mr. Winnie, if you. If there's a seat opens up, we'll get you to sit next to it. Ms. Simmons, welcome. Is it on? Okay. It is on. Gail Simmons, Civics 307, and I, I made my comments based on the page in the county clerk's uh, presentation. Okay. So... The first one on page six, where it talks about the uh, change in registration uh, subsequent to the primary, I would just recommend either a, a rule or a statute that places that certification of the candidates. 
So for 2024, for example, that would be 5 September 23. That basically puts a, a line in the sand as to when people can then change after the, the primary. And it's actually after the reporting is done as of the first of the following month. Then on page 17, there is uh, on the third bullet, rate change in uh, affiliation. That comment reflects, I believe the intention of House Bill 103, but not the language that was actually passed. So um, I would recommend a change of statute to 225214 uh, sub A, where it says declare or change to remove declare or, because as was stated, if you are registered as an unaffiliated, that's actually your party registration. So that would make it change and then insert an existing registration record. So I wanna stop here and say that for a transactional database, which WireReg is, they don't actually purge as in remove a, a, a record. What they do is there's one field on there that is a binary indicating whether that record is active or inactive. All of the rest of the information remains there. So when they purge, they're actually changing that one field from active to inactive and everything else remains the same. And in fact, they actually put in, it, it captures the last day that record was, was altered. So you actually have the ability, the, the clerks have the ability to determine when it, uh, the last record was made. So if it was inactive and the last record change was after that period of time, they would know that. So um, I'm gonna make that uh, request. That will also take care of the problem that was identified of say somebody who's turning 18 uh, after that period, they should be allowed to vote or they moved in afterwards. And uh, that would be a new registration. So it wouldn't apply to them because that would be a brand new record. Um, so that, that change, and I'll, I'll be happy to write that out and send that to you. Uh, 223115A subparagraph uh, four assumes cancellation uh, is, uh, occurs solely for the purpose of skirting the statute on party affiliation. I think that that is an inaccurate and inappropriate assumption to make. Uh, it is unnecessary and duplicative uh, with the other process. So if you make the first change I have, where you're catching anybody who did inactivate their record, then you don't need to tell them that we're going to hold you hostage and you can't cancel your registration when you move out of the state so that you can register somewhere else. So that whole thing is, I would just recommend you e eliminate that altogether. Um, on page 21 on challenge of citizenship, I would just like um, to add in there, maybe it is a rule, a declaration of the reason for the challenge by whom it was made. So who's being challenged? What caused them to challenge it? What time did they make it? Who did they make it? So that there's a record that that challenge exists. Make sure that we don't get a pattern. Page 22 on the application on item eight, uh, the clerks can check or validate using the SSN, which we can't see, but they can. This goes back to whether they can see that a record actually exists. And when they search that, they don't search just the active, they search all of them. So in effect, when you move from one place to another, they're just, uh, you know, you stay active, you're still in there, or even if you canceled, they can still see that. So, so from a database perspective, that, um, that simply isn't uh, necessary. Uh, on the poll watchers, uh, my recommendation is that there be some standard guidance, guidance that is provided that specifically addresses for the poll watchers so it is consistent throughout all 23 counties. Um, if they see that they, or they consider that there's a problem, who do they tell, when do they tell, and how do they tell? We heard a lot of anecdotal, oh, well, there, this was a problem. It would be nice to actually have that be uh, documented um, again for the anecdotal. And then finally, 
uh, thank you for the for uh, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, Chairman, um, for the thanking the clerks who actually run our elections. Uh, I have a significant concern that there is an individual who I don't know is paying, who's been going around to various areas within the state. And, and basically applying the debunked information from, from 2000 mules as if that applied to Wyoming without actually checking to see if it's even possible. When they, when they came to Sheridan, I asked which clerks they had talked to and the answer was none. And most of what I heard them saying was inaccurate, was, did not uh, apply for that. Uh, and then finally, I would just like to start seeing more concern about getting qualified and registered electors who are not voting to actually come out and vote instead of spending all of our time, energy, and efforts trying to stop people who actually do want to vote. So, and I stand for questions. So, Ms. Simmons, thank you uh, for all of that. Uh, when it comes time to, to either suggest legislation or to work it, uh, would you be willing to provide uh, those suggestions to us? I, there's no way I could have written those down that quickly and um, cited them correctly. So I would appreciate that. So thank you. Mr. Chair, absolutely. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Any questions for Ms. Simmons? Well, let's hear, let's hear from somebody else from the Navy. Go Navy Beat Army. Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, Bill Winnie, Sublet County. <laughs> In a uh, single vignette, I'd like to echo Senator Scott's uh, words about county clerks. Mary Langford here was my county clerk, 30 years active duty in the Navy. Uh, submarines frequently do sneaky peach stuff and are out uh, 60 or more days at a whack. I never missed a ballot, a chance to ballot. So uh, well done. Uh, with regard to the how you, you uh, how you handle the absentee ballot request for active duty members. There's a page in a service record that denotes where their home is, their home. Uh, it really calls it a domicile, but it's it's the uh, residence. You call it a state of residence. Um, that's commonly handled by the admin people, but there's a quirk on the federal postcard application that the county clerks need to pay attention to because it says, your last address in the state where you want to vote, but you need not have any affiliation with that address currently. And so they could get a, an application with an address on it and they go to their records and say, what the heck? That, that's the words on the application. So just something to be aware of. Um, and the admin office uh, or, or personnel office on a unit can handle that stuff very easily. As a side note, you sometimes hear people refer to a page in a service record called home of record. That has nothing to do with your state of residence. That is purely the location from which you entered active duty to which the federal government is obligated to send you back to when you leave active duty. Your residence can change and your state of residence where you vote can change. Subject to your questions, thank you. Anybody else in the audience uh, or here present wish to testify? How about online? Let's go online. We'd very much like to hear from Ms. Burns. So let's get that one started. And then uh, Ms. Talbot, there was another one from Cheyenne that you mentioned. Julie, Julie Formby. Okay. The warm out. I'm sorry about that. But um, let's hear from Ms. Dana Burns. It's okay. Yes. Go good ahead. morning. Good morning. Welcome. Hello. Hello. Uh, yes. Go ahead. Case, you... It's nice. Yes. Hello, committee. Uh, Chairperson Case. Um, First, I, I would really like to thank uh, Director Obrecht 
and his LSO staff for helping me today uh, testify via telephone. And I would also like to thank the proactive clerks that testified. I learned a lot uh, from their testimony today, and it's obvious they have a lot of responsibility and, and they uh, care about what they're doing. But I'm here today to actually share my experience with um, voter intimidation and harassment in Johnson County, Wyoming. And I uh, shared a, a letter that was sent to me by my county clerk telling me that I did not experience intimidation or, or harassment while I voted. Um, you should know, I don't believe I've ever spoken to the clerk. And she notes in the letter about the county attorney, the county attorney never sat down with me to have a formal interview. Two people decided that I was not intimidated or harassed. I know I was. And in the casual telling of the story to my doctor, he compared it, uh, he said, oh, it's, it's like when we charge WNL within normal limits. He says, do you know what that really means? What it really means is we never looked. And it appears no one is really looking at our election security. I went to our county clerk, I was ignored. I went to uh, the county attorney, I was ignored. Uh, I went to my representative, I was ignored. Well, every, everyone in the state knows my senator is MIA. And I went to the Secretary of State who said go to the clerk where I was ignored. Today I come to you where I think I know I won't be ignored. So I really want to thank the committee for the opportunity. Uh, the poll worker who harassed and intimidated me soon after moving here from South Dakota, ran and was elected to the legislature. He is a current city council member. He is a current chair of the Johnson County Republicans. What he did was ask me a hot button political question once in public and I answered. The second time he asked me, I was trying to vote. It was a shibboleth. It made me uncomfortable. And I didn't realize until telling my mother how I did not want to go vote in person that I had indeed been intimidated. And it was the next election when I got ready to go vote and sharing the story with my mother. I said, I, I really don't wanna go, but if I do go, if he does it again, I'm going to raise my hand and call for a poll watcher or call for someone. Because I, I don't know, I, I was taught growing up that poll workers were not to engage, especially in political discussions. Uh, but then the process of the, the complaint process of the voter intimidation turned out to be just as damning as the intimidation and, and the harassment. And I'm asking you please today, if you will consider legislating a timely, transparent process for complaints. Because obviously I received that letter from my clerk via an email chain. Um, I think we need, we need a solid process to follow the complaint. And I'm also concerned about the security of elections if only one or two people are deciding. And uh, perhaps, perhaps we need a, a committee in place, a county committee, or maybe even a state committee. But what I found out is we don't know how many complaints were made. We don't know how many complaints in each precinct were made. We don't know how many complaints um, were made by county. We don't even know how many complaints of harassment and intimidation were in the whole state. I was a little shocked by that information. 
um, after all, it, it is a barometer of our election security. Also, my clerk was appointed through a vacancy process, and she doesn't seem to have accountability to voters. You read the letter. And may we please change the law and fill vacancies for elected officials through elections. Because I think what I understand is that my clerk was installed in her position by the poll worker who harassed me. The complaint process definitely needs oversight and record keeping. And lastly, perhaps we need consistent training for poll training unrelated to the political parties. I mean, how do we even know we have secure elections in Wyoming when we are WNL? We never look. Anyway, thank you today. And uh, I stand for questions if you have any. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Burns. Let's see if we have any questions. Any questions for Ms. Burns? Any questions? Ms. Burns, I'm not seeing any questions, but um, I'm very grateful for your testimony. And we're going to discuss the issue of poll watchers and, and, and intimidation of voters. Uh, I'm not sure where we'll go, vacancy. but we will be discussing. Mr. Chairman, perhaps vacancy. Um, I'll put vacancies on the list and thank you very much. Appreciate it, Ms. Burns. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for your patience today and uh, have a great day. Thank Appreciate you, your Chairman. bravery in coming forward. Okay. Um, looking to the committee, anybody else have anything? Representative Cheswick, you want to? Okay. Uh, on a general election stuff, though. Doesn't it connect? We're going to be done with the elections, uh, except for coming back to decide what we want to do for our next meeting. So do you want to address this about your proposal? I mean, I'm sorry, but we have other Secretary of State office update and we have public comment, but we're going to do that after lunch. I'm trying to get all the election stuff out of the way with public comment right now. So if you'd come forward, appreciate it. Sorry about the confusion. I've never been confused myself, and <laughs> today might be the day, but you traveled a long ways to talk to us, so go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I do have some hand, uh, handout. I'm sure you have a mic, but so we might get uh, Ms. Talbot, or I'll, I'll help you with your handout, and you can just get started. And everybody, just what I'm doing here is all the topics are kind of on the table is, and then we'll break for lunch. And we'll sort this out later. Well, Not we'll sure decide on the next meeting. Okay, this, Mr. Representative Cheswick. Is this mic on? Yes, it is. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, thank you, Mr. Co-Chairman. Um, I am here uh, on an unrelated topic, but it's, uh, I'll give a very brief update uh, or um, review of history. I'll try to be very brief because I know where you're, trying to get to lunch, uh, so I won't take too much time, but uh, what's being handed out is a, a copy of a, a Senate Joint Resolution 6, which was introduced last session and was defeated on third reading uh, in the Senate. Uh, this was actually a committee bill, uh, and I am asking um, this committee, this committee actually adopted this bill in the last interim session last year. I think the vote was 11 to 3. Um, and then it went to um, the Senate first and was defeated there. I, I did try and reintroduce it in the House, uh, but we didn't, uh, this corporation committee did not have, have time to get to it, so it died because we didn't get to it at that point. This is a bill that deals with um, campaign finance reporting. Uh, it's something we've tried. I, I have worked on this bill for quite a long time as first as chair of the group called Wyoming Promise. Some of you may have recalled uh, a number of years ago, um, a citizen group organized to try and get a ballot measure on the ballot to uh, seek a constitutional, a U.S. constitutional amendment to um, declare that money is not speech and corporations are not people, and that um, this legislature and Congress both have the right to put reasonable restrictions on 
political expenditures, um, and mostly to uh, limit or require a robust disclosure of disclosures of money spent on political campaigns by non-human entities. Uh, the committee last year uh, with Senator Scott and Senator uh, Case, both um, providing great input, uh, had uh, reworked the language uh, to what is now in front of you. Um, and uh, that's how we got the 11 to three vote in the corporations committee. And I'm asking if this committee would consider um, putting this back into a committee bill to be introduced, and again, either in the budget session coming up or maybe in 2025. This committee would hear it next session, next summer, or the, uh, either way. Um, I, I do want to get it reintroduced. I, I don't know for sure why um, the, the bill died in the Senate because it was on cons the, the consent agenda, and then um, after. Uh, of course, consent agendas always pass, and then on the changes of the vote, 18 people stood up to change the vote, and there was no discussion, no debate, so I'm not quite sure what happened or why. What little I did hear uh, from talking to a few folks was that there may have been some confusion about whether this bill um, exempted uh, or gave unions a certain advantage over corporations. I don't think it does but I would propose uh, reintroducing this with some clarifying language that, this, that unions are would be within the same, uh, have, play by the same rules as corporations would, uh, and that would be the only amendment I might make to the language of the bill. Um, but um, th this is a problem that's not going away. The last page of this handout shows that um, better spending in elections is going up dramatically. The first page of the handout shows that between 2016 and 2020, um, the uh, amount of outside money being spent by super PACs, corporations, unions, foreign governments, more than doubled in four years. Uh, and it's only gonna get worse. Every year it's been going up. Uh, this is a bipartisan problem. Uh, it's not something that one side does more than the other. I think uh, it's kind of a, um, arms race, <clears throat> I think in 2020 was the first year that the Democratic, that, that money spent to support Democratic candidates exceeded the money spent for Republican candidates. So the Democrats are getting pretty good at this. Um, but also, but I think in the 2022, uh, it, the Republicans may have retaken the lead. It's an arms race. Both sides are uh, racing to spend money to support their candidates and the voices of, human, of ordinary citizens, human beings, you and I, uh, we don't have billions of dollars to spend on campaigns. We're limited by how much we're allowed to spend uh, in direct support of, cam of candidates. So this is a problem that's not going away. It's getting worse every year. And I would like to see us address that at some point. Uh, and so I, I put this to the committee. If you would consider this as an interim uh, topic to actually pro propose a bill, uh, again, for either uh, the budget session coming up or uh, maybe more likely for the 2025 um, general session. I'm happy to stand for questions. Or Representative Chestnick. Any questions? Thank you very much, sir. We'll, we'll put it on our list. Thank you. Anything else? Any other testimony before the committee? I do have one more thing. It's very quick. Uh, with regards to reporting of political expenditures, um, our law requires that, uh, hold on here, I had it up and my computer would sleep and now I can't type my password. Um, basically the state of the law is that everyone that makes a political expenditure uh, to influence a ballot proposition or an election has to file a, a campaign report. And uh, the only exception would be individuals, um, political parties, um, PACs, which are covered within the report, and a, uh, and a candidate's campaign uh, committee. So if we've had this discussion before, when a group of people get together and decide they're going to buy election influence through an ad or whatever, um, they are required to file a report of their expenditures and receipt. 
That's not happening. Didn't happen in Fremont County for one group. And um, I'd like to propose that we look at tightening that up too. And it, it's against the law now, but it's being uh, just ignored. Ms. Fries, uh, I, I think you might know what I'm talking about. Happened right here in Fremont County. So anyway, I'll throw that on the list. and We can discuss later um, that we're ready for lunch. Mr. Co-Chair, that, that one's not working out. Hello, hello. Okay. Um, unless you have an objection, Mr. Co-Chairman, when we, what I would suggest is when we come back, maybe we, we reserve some time to um, first take up any bill drafts on the elections topic, since it was it's a big topic. There's a lot of bills before we move on to the general um, updates from the Secretary of State's office. So with that committee, if you're thinking of any bill drafts on the elections topic, um, be thinking about that over lunch, and then when we come back. Um, we'll take any motions on it. That'd be my thoughts. I'm definitely good with that. Um, you know, we were, we're not going to get out early this afternoon. Um, <laughs> anyway, let's take a, you think we could do an hour and 15 minutes for lunch? Would that be reasonable? I'm, well, you know, it's kind of hard. The places are spread out. It's, there's nothing. So I'd say an hour and 15 minutes, just be back at one or 2.15. Thank you very much. I'm going to go try to renew my driver's license. So you may never see me again. <laughs> and uh, the governor's office, uh, Drew Perkins, definitely we have contact information for him so that he can be clued in. Thank you. <laughs>